understand the risk to our country. Freedom brings people together. You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at wearelibertarians.com. You'd think at this point Harry would have that down, but every single time, he scares the heck out of himself. Remind me when we get into the show to tell you about heck. Interesting discovery there. Uh, Thank you, memes. Welcome to episode 337 of We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle. You are going to hear a program about the Gillette commercial. What is toxic masculinity? We're also going to talk about the Yellow Vest revolution taking place in France and some of the claims that are out there. And uh, Paul Copeland is here from the We Are Libertarians Dailies. Harry Price is here, and he is annoying the hell out of me. So stay tuned, and I'll tell you why. Warning. This show is for adults, produced by semi-adults. So the language is sometimes strong and offensive. Uh, I don't know what I said. Uh. Welcome to We Are Libertarians, where our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking to your friends. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective while treating modern politics with all of the irreverence it deserves. There has been lie after lie. We toss out the screaming heads, put people before political parties, and give context to the news to make you think. Now, here's our host, a 15-year veteran of politics and media, Chris Spangle. Uh, it's been several months, and I still love that introduction. I, I just love the... I love it. So good. Uh, Ben's Town are the people that uh, did that for us. Very professional. Like, uh, like the man said, you're listening to We Are Libertarians, where we... Talk politics from a libertarian perspective. Try to make you sound smarter when you're talking with your friends. We try to bring people together through conversation. Uh, We have a definite point of view, but we try not to be mean about it. Uh, We're from the Midwest. We're very nice people. What? Let me just turn this off. Uh, One of those people, uh, that was abrupt, uh, is Paul Copeland. Paul, how are you? I'm doing well. Paul's a very nice Midwestern man, single ladies. Um, he, he is just very polite. You're, you, are you from Indianapolis? Uh, Southern Indiana. Okay. What part of Southern Indiana? Towards Madison, Indiana. Okay. Uh, Cincinnati corner of the state. All right. So th- that's, that's down by the Ohio river near Kentucky for you people who don't know geography. And then there's Harry who I would not co- co- I would not qualify as a polite Midwesterner. He's been nothing but a pain in my face ass the entire time the second he walked in harry did he not start instantaneously it was amusing to see <laughs> it, it, people don't <laughs> believe me they think this is shtick but it is it was instant and swift was it not harry first off by the way how are you harry i'm going good all right oh i was i just have grown accustomed to way certain things are in the studio and when you just change them up without warning i don't like it I like it. See, and, I, and you're right. I wasn't born here in the Midwest, from Boston. Check whoa, it in. where, where who lives? A certain former co-host of the show uh, did not get fired. You just left. Yeah. No. Well, he had a good reason to leave. Yeah. <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> she is fine. If you've if you've watched some of the past episodes, you'll see why. Morgan is a very attractive girl, and uh, she is at Harvard, and he followed her out there, and he left for love. We do not fault people who leave for love. I know some of you think we do, but we do not. We do not fault those who leave for love. Um, But, uh, Harry, uh, I did warn you. I did tell you I was going to clean up the studio area and probably shift things around. I think you just don't remember. You blocked it out of your mind, but it doesn't matter. Had I cleaned it up and had ma- had it the same way, you'd you'd throw a fit. Throwing a fit. I'm also going to uh, declare a state of emergency. <laughs> <clears throat> Paul got here to the studio on time, and you weren't. And um, you know what? I think Paul is owed, deserves a public apology. See, we've had many emergencies, so many emergencies, Paul, that I forgot about that emergency. <laughs> because he walked in and declared an emergency about the table being changed, which you can see at YouTube. Uh, thanks to everybody that, y- yes, that, uh, I, listen, it is more annoying for me. I'm all off. I'm like, everything's moving. The thing about it is we inhabit this space for several hours a week, and so things get all gummed up, and you got to tear it all down and clean everything, and I sanitize the table and the chairs and you know, get all the get all the nerd off the tables, and then uh, so you have to sh- shift it around. And we had it in a way that just was not conducive to video, 
and uh, and so I switched it back because I feel this is better for the viewer, and it's better mostly for me when I live here. It's a little more inconvenient when I'm doing the show. It's more inconvenient for Harry when he's here for two or three hours a week. But I'm sorry, like I can use this as a table again, which is the purpose of this particular living space. I had it set up perfectly for ergonomics you had a perfect table space when you worked over here right perfect table space for guests perfect table space for myself when i was here and during the week when you used it as a quote-unquote table in this magical world you had you know almost eight feet of space on the outside that you could use no now you've got if you put someone there at that table they're like blocking the entire hallway so this guy's got to like move anytime someone has to use the bathroom so what- i agree we moved it for that very reason but the fact is is this is how it's staying i conveniently moved us along and completely distracted from my public apology to paul you sure did <laughs> did you see that yeah it's, oh, I was going to bring this back around but after the talk of it shorting. It must be hard being in the presence of greatness when it comes to deflection. The width of this table needs to go down by at least a foot and a half. You can't. This is this is the table. I can extend it. I can make this the Last Supper table. I, it could go the length of the apartment. You There's so many leaves to this table. Needs to shrink it down. It's not happening. It is You're, too big. You know what and I it need? it eats up a lot of space. A new co-host. That's it eats up a lot of space. <laughs> Paul, what are you doing on Tuesday nights? And uh, when we you got and I both know the answer to that question is <laughs> nothing. Not, not much. Ladies, <laughs> he's got nothing to do. He's, he's available at any time to do anything you want. And I mean anything. Right? Within reason. Mm, no, there, let's there, not there, get picky about this. There are this. certain things that are premium. <laughs> certain things are premium. All right. Um, some of the things weren't plugged in. That's, we that's also right. had to yes. adjust the table because you didn't make it so you didn't give me a nice adequate fire exit back here, which was the original reason which why you, we moved the table in the first place. You realize you greatly insulted Paul and called him fat. I didn't. You called him a fire hazard. I just you I, called. I think you owe him a public apology. He's, I you said literally said there. It said I I hazard. will die if Paul sits here. He's a fire hazard. I heard it. Did you hear it? I said person. There was that implication. No. <laughs> You call <laughs> you fat shamed poor Paul, <laughs> who has done nothing but be your friend, which is not easy. No, it is not. He was also it your employee, not. which <laughs> is way worse. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Harry is kind of a tantruming child. Uh, he's one of the most responsible grown up people I've ever met. But he's also how is how is your daughter? Because uh, Gunther must just be a handful if she's anything like you. I pray she's like Lacey. But although knowing what I know about uh, about your wife. She's really you're the you're the behave well behaved one, right? Correct. Yeah. Uh yeah, uh Gunther has gotten very how can I put it, demanding. You know, she's understanding, you know, what she can command and and I'm also noticing there's a lot of uh she's so she's used to trying to break me my stubbornness down. So when she's around other people, they, she breaks them very easily. Right. You know, with me she could sit there and cry and I remember it's, Lacey's came home and she was just sitting there crying, and I was just there eating her dinner in front of her because <laughs> she was just having a tantrum. I'm like, well, I'm eating this. You know what we're going to do? What? We're going to move the board back over here. Uh, th- th- there's plenty of space, and and I got used to having it just right here, and mm-hmm. I'm looking at you, and I can do all my little things. I can't go all the way back here. This is inconvenient. So, I was right. No, you were not right, but I, th- th- moving this over here was a mistake. That part we're gonna change, right now. Let's do it. Here. <laughs> no, we're not. We'll, we'll wait till after. All right, the back program. to Paul's apology. Um, yes, Paul is uh, looking for preferable employment. I, I won't say gainful employment. <coughs> apology. I said apology. I'm getting there. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> you, I host this show. Co-host, no, not not in this state not of host. emergency. The state of emergency. <laughs> you've, you've gone Alexander Haig all of a sudden. <laughs> yes. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Alexander Haig, when President Reagan was shot, was like the Secretary of Agriculture or something, and stood up and declared that he was in charge. Mm-hmm. I think he might have been Secretary of State, but uh, it was very weird. And ever and George H. W. Bush was like, nah, I don't think so. Who was Vice President? And it's that that that. And what, it didn't it spawn like a movie. It was a crappy movie that it spawned. I don't too. remember. It was a couple of scenes that it spawned. Was that was it Air Force One? Uh, whatever. It doesn't know. matter. Yeah, it's it's does. a Let's crappy see. movie that it like helped spawn a couple of scenes. Back to Paul. Paul, 
uh, is going to help out and, and do some things digitally. You know, we don't tag our posts. We have like 2,000 WordPress posts on weirdlibertarians.com, and he's going to go and put tags in them. He's going to update some. He's just going to do a little spring cleaning, and uh, it's going to be very uh, a lot of work. And um, we were to meet an hour before the program started, and we were going to go through this stuff. And uh, about 6.10, because we were going to meet at 6, I get a note from him that says, I'm hoping you're just in the bathroom or something. It was uh, like... and uh, gazing out over the parking lot, and I realized that your vehicle isn't here. <laughs> and uh, that's when I realized it was Tuesday. <laughs> it wasn't that I had lost track of time. I've lost track of days at this point. Well, it's hilarious because yesterday you said, can you come over tomorrow at 6? Right. It's like... There's not even like an excuse of losing track of what day it was. It's literally the next day. Literally the next day. <laughs> yes. This is the level that I'm at now. When I hit 34, something happened and and everything in my brain broke. And all of a sudden I became Albert Einstein without the joy. <laughs> I just was I had I leave my house without my pants on. Uh, I need my hair's a mess. Um that's a joke. My hair's great. That's like the one good thing that I I like I don't know about you, Paul. Harry is full of himself, but I have like one good thing about me as a as a man who's larger. I look at my hair and I'm like, at least I have that. Like I have that, okay? At least at least my physical looks. I'm a solid five. All right, nobody laughed. I'm a solid five. I just thought you were reaching, but keep going. <laughs> and and at, but at least my hair is that of a ten. So. But uh, what was I talking about? You got seven beard. Paul's apology. <sighs> He's not letting this go. All right, Paul, I am sorry I was late. It was rude and disrespectful of your time. I would say that it won't happen again, but it will happen again unless you remind me uh, because um, I'm a mess. Yep. Is that good enough for you? Yeah. It's bad that you do it to me, which I made myself a key, so it's okay. But Paul, <laughs> he, just, he was just locked out. I told him about that. I, I called him on the phone. So we talked on the phone so we didn't waste the time. And uh, I was like, yeah, I, I had to actually have a talk. Like, this is all, like, we banter back and forth. But I had to have a serious talk with Harry when he made a key without permission, without me noticing. It's not like he took my key and went over to the to the Menards. He, he took, like, wax paper when I wasn't looking and, and made a key. And I I show up one day and Harry is here, he's he's got something in the lock trying to pick the lock to break into my house. I go, Harry, this is the south side. You cannot do that here. They don't allow that sort of. Th they don't. You don't. You're not gonna get through this if you break into my house. So they, but if I took rims, I'd be fine. You took rim. They don't give a. They don't <laughs> care about the rims. Yeah. But uh, the, you know, <laughs> let's be honest. So somebody's got some. Yeah, it's Harry. It's that 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 cable. There's something weird about that particular cable or microphone. So we'll yeah, we'll just deal with it. To the left. Yeah, j just jiggle into the left. All right, enough, enough, enough. Let's let's get on to the uh, to the big show. We're going to talk about uh, the Yellow Vest protest. Some great research. Sam Schmidt. No, Sam Schmidt. That's the. the, the uh, I. Boys, uh, you may have to take over, Harry, as vice president of We Are Libertarians. Get ready to. Uh, you may have to issue Article 25. Article 25, subsection B. Yep. All right. So. Oh, oh you want me to spot it? You spot it up? No. <laughs> I figured you'd come up with some gold, but no, apparently not. Um, so, uh, Sam Schultz is the great researcher who's been doing such a good job of uh, putting things together. Uh, and so we're going to talk about th that and uh, Paul Joseph Watson, which we're going to take a risk. We might play a PJ PJW uh, video. So d we'll, we'll discuss it before we do, just it's, uh, for the health of the program. But I want to start with the Gillette commercial. Now, you're not going to be able to see this. Uh, you'll have to go and watch it, but I'll play the audio, and I'll kind of describe what's happening in the video. Now, Gillette... You know, what? do you have that old commercial that you were playing? I could probably pull it up here. You know, everybody knows. Yeah, the Gillette commercial. Right. Uh, the best a man can get. Yeah. <sighs> Sorry, I had to belch there. Uh, yeah, it's just see. the Gillette commercial. Because I, I, I think like, that's most 
razor most guys start off with is Gillette because it's the one the advertising. Yeah, is well, everywhere. Like, this is this is the the eighties yeah. here. You're yeah. looking sharp. You're looking good. You've come so far. It's like an eighties dude. He's running track. He's helping his son shave. He's getting into the to the limousine, winning the football game, teaching his son to comb his hair. Oh. Now, the thing about this commercial, this is from 1989. You know, they're introducing the three blades. You know, astronaut, Wall Street, running races, sports, athletes. They're showing you... Here we go. So that that is their shtick, right? So the best a man can get. And they, they aired this commercial in 89, and I don't know that this was the first, but this is just the one that popped up on YouTube. And their whole vibe is here's the modern man, the t- the man who is, you know, a good father and a good athlete and a good businessman and, and a well-rounded member of society. Here he is getting married. Uh, and, and it's very subtle, right? It's mm-hmm. very subtle advertising. Correct. So Gillette used their slogan and they came out with a new advertisement uh boys will be boys question isn't it time we stopped excusing bad behavior rethink and take action by joining us at the best a man can be and so the commercial about two minutes long starts with uh an uh, a black american a black gentleman could be harry's father a very good looking handsome man looks sort of like um um who is uh avon barksdale's assistant in the wire Idris Elba, he looks kind of like that. He's staring in the mirror, and he's got this uh, this tough look. And this is how the commercial opens. Bullying. The Me the Too movement against sexual toxic harassment. Masculinity. Toxic, this- toxic masculinity. Bullying. Me Too. It's the best a man can get. Is it? And there's an image of a group of teenage boys chasing another teenage boy. A b- a boy in his mother's arms as text messages are coming in that say everyone hates you. We can't hide from it. It's been going on far too long. Some images on TV of groping on television and commercials that uh, and cartoons that are a little uh, blue. We can't laugh it off. Who's the daddy? <laughs> Who's the daddy? What I actually think she's trying to say. Making the same. Old- uh, there's a boardroom, and he puts his hand on the woman's shoulder and says, "What she's actually trying to say." Old excuses. Boys will be boys. Boys will be boys. Boys will be boys. But something finally changed. Allegations regarding sexual assault and sexual harassment. But she says And there will be no going back. Because we, we believe in the best in men. Men need to hold other men accountable. Smile, sweetie. Come on. To say the right... Uh, a group of teenage boys at a party, and one of the guys says to the girl, smile, sweetie, and another man steps up and says, come on, dude. Thing. To act the right uh, way. Bro, not cool, not cool. Uh, a woman walks by, and a guy starts trying to catcall her, and another guy grabs him and says, not cool. Um, already are. In ways big. Yo, men. And small. I am strong. Now, there were some boys fighting, and that's what prompted all the dads to say boys will be boys. And uh, one of the guys, one of the little kids, probably about five, is getting his butt kicked in this fight. So now one of, one of the dads runs over and grabs the boys. But some is not enough. It's not how we treat each other, okay? It's not how we treat each other. Because the boys watching today will be the men. Now, that group of uh, teenage boys uh, chasing the other teenage boy, a man is holding his, hand, his son's hand and runs over, and he stops the other boys. And uh, as 
uh, it's actually kind of a touching moment. The the dad breaks up the fight. You start to see uh, the gaze of his son watch him break that fight up. And then you see the faces of all these other boys in all these other situations where men are stepping up and saying, that's not how you treat a woman. That's not how you treat another man. That's not how you treat somebody. You start to see the faces of these boys as you hear this voiceover. But some is not enough. It's not how we treat each other, okay? Okay. Because the boys watching today will be the men of tomorrow. Men can only be men if it's only by challenging ourselves to do more that we can get closer to our best. We are taking action at thebestmencanbe.org. Join us at Gillette. Now, uh, solicited some comments on this on social media, and I wanted to see what people thought of it. And uh, I hit up our group. Uh, where you, We talked. Uh, we, we didn't talk about this, but there's uh, visuals. If you want to see the actual apartment, then you can go watch the Facebook Live that we did before the show started in the group, but also weigh in on this if you would like. Um, because I'm interested in your thoughts. Because this is this seems like it's easy and it seems like it's complicated in 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 different ways, which we'll kind of get into. Um, but I think it's an important conversation, and uh, it's sad that uh, commercials have to spark it. So, Chris on Facebook said, "Well said. That commercial is awesome." Uh, you know, my comment when I posted the video on Twitter and Facebook was. If you're mad about the Gillette commercial, you're probably the guy that needs this the most. Uh, <laughs> female after female f- after female have been liking my comment. Um, let's see. Uh, Lynn says, the best commercial ever. They should have saved it for the Super Bowl. Uh, Trent says, I watched it just to see what the com- commotion was about. If I had to complain, I'd say that the term toxic masculinity is subjective and can be molded, modified at whim. But that's about it. I'm not losing sleep over it. I'm a barstool safety razor guy through and through. Amanda Jordan, um, apologize for saying your last name, but uh, Amanda says, I'm glad you posted this. Ironically, it will carry more weight if men voice their support. I just get called a feminazi if I say anything. And Lynn replied, so true. And I said, you know, members of the in-group can be more honest. So in-group meaning we're in-group of men, mm-hmm. um, out-group meaning women, Uh Harry is the in group of of black Americans and uh, waifus, and then <laughs> Paul and I are the out group of black Americans. Right, we're on the outside looking into that particular group, and Harry's looking into white America, going white people. Sp- sp- food needs more spice. Appropriate your culture. Use mayonnaise. <laughs> mayonnaise today. Um, and so what's really important in society and what we really r- try to, to preach here in and We Are Libertarians is that uh, Harry has different experiences as a black man that we can learn from as white, pe- as white men. Women can learn from men and men can learn, learn from women. I think one of the great things about the Me Too movement is that men are sitting there having conversations with their female friends going, oh, I didn't understand what it was like for life it, it, to experience life through your eyes. Uh, sometimes I think men get a little angry because we don't feel that same appreciation of, I need you to understand how life presents itself as a man in 2019. And our, and our female friends kind of go, but women have this and that. And it's like, no, just I'm trying to understand you. You try to understand me. Correct. That, But that's me being biased and, and prickly about that because I, I go, well, you're not listening. <laughs> you know, so... Um, uh, so, you know, Amanda, so I said, listen, members of the end group can be more honest. It's why we need women to deal with false accusations. Men just look like they're trying to protect the patriarchy. Mm-hmm. So, you know, having gone through false a- accusations, but also having helped friends through domestic violence and sexual abuse, there's validity to both sides of these arguments. It's not, you don't have to stand with all men and all false, ac- all the accusations are false. And you don't have to stand with all women and say, you know, every single woman who ever tells a story is telling the truth. Like there's, there, there, there's. You have to have conversations around these things and understand the facts. And it's easier for uh, everyone to do that when members of an in group kind of step up and say, you know what? Hold on, wait a minute. Let's hear. Like, listen, you need to understand the way that you speak to women is inappropriate. 
because women apparently when they say that are not getting through to you or if you're in a power group a power dynamic at work and someone is not listening to some person who has no authority but you have some authority you have a better chance of getting that person heard because you're in the inner, you're in the boardroom right so you're in the power group and the person out of the power group can have more leverage if a person in the in group decides to like lay down the war uh, the war equipment and actually says you know what let me listen to what this person's saying so a lot of what we've always advocated about men's issues women's issues racial issues all of this is let's just talk it out let's try and understand where we're coming from and understand this and when men say yeah men could do better <laughs> then it has probably more of an impact that's why you know if this had come from um what's a if this had come from tampax <laughs> we'd be like well that seems preachy you know but it's coming from gillette a, a decidedly male brand so where we go as men go eh, let's see take a look at this um Amanda replied, true. It's difficult, though, because any issue, if you don't say exactly what the other person expects to hear, it's a shit show. There's also a wealth of misunderstanding on all sides, but like karma, cognitive dissonance is a bitch. Uh, Colin replies, I think this commercial is really stupid. The people that made this are dirty buttholes. Uh, it is kind of dumb on the aspect that I'm tired of, uh, you know, uh, what is it? Deodorant brands or different commercials trying right. to be, you know. G g doing all this stuff for advertising sake. Yes. No, I should send them a bill for $200 for the advertising for this particular program. Yeah. This is what they, this is native advertising. This is viral marketing. This is, I'm going to do something that sparks conversation. Uh, I think there's good intentions behind this. Mm -hmm. I, I yes. think, whereas like with Nike, they intentionally provoked a certain segment of society and wanted to raise the ire of a certain group of people mainly white Americans, by using Colin Kaepernick. Mm -hmm. And it, they were intentionally trying to provoke. Whereas I think with this, they're trying to go for a much more neutral, like, here, we believe this. I really believe in pretty much everything this says. I don't know about you guys. Like, when I hear this, when I watch this, it grabs me. I go, yes, I agree with this. You know, and there are men, and, and myself included, that can do better in certain aspects. Just like there are women who can do can do better in terms of their role in society and their a and aspects of their personal growth. Like, um, I think every human being grows into being a better person. So, like, the content of the ad I don't have a problem with. But I think where people get disconnected, like you, is, like, I, you're marketing to me and I'm falling for it. Well, yeah, they're just, they're just trying to um, – they're going over to social cause and trying to market with me. They've done that with the last few Dove ads. Um, they've done that with also, like, a lot of uh, – De uh, ladies deodorant in the past so they just kind of moved it over here with the ad i did have an i did have an issue with them saying toxic masculinity because it's not real it's it's poorly defined people are getting hung up on this but this was like an it's it's set it, but it's it was yeah, a it, setup it was the problem a, is it's poorly defined right like that, but that's the issue with like that. listen to how it's it's like a news report it's it's really like as a person who would write a commercial like listen to the way that it's used here Masculinity. Is this the best a man can? It's not the voiceover guy saying men are toxic. It's it's sort of yeah. like it's framing. Well, it's it's framing. It's saying here's what you need to expect. And like toxic masculinity clearly is one of those words that got your attention, which is what they're trying to do. The only thing it did was made me put my defensive, made me get defensive and think like, uh oh, here's a straw man building. They're building it up. Right. <laughs> well. I think one of the bigger problems is is a lot of men are feeling attacked from all angles because you have the, uh, I forget which psychology board coming out here in just the last couple of weeks here, and basically saying that traditional masculinity is toxic in nature. And, you know, a lot of men are looking at, like, what, being the provider for my family? You know, mm -hmm. that's toxic. You know, right. Those traditional roles, those traditional values. Right. And, you know, as somebody who aims for a more traditional role in a family myself, I when I see something like that, I have to admit I haven't gone through to read everything that they've put forward there, but it feels kind of insulting. And I think that, you know, that followed up by a commercial from Gillette, they don't even need to 
exactly look at what the actual messaging is. They just feel attacked. I feel it's the wrong tone necessarily to take, especially for a toiletries company, you know, getting involved in the social quagmire. Yeah. Uh, now this is the this is the story you referenced, Brianna Helt at Town Hall, which is a right leaning source uh, story. American Psychological Association, the APA, which is a big deal, labels traditional masculinity as harmful. So that's the headline. But we know that reading headlines doesn't necessarily read right. the truth, right? Mm-hmm. So let's read a little bit in it. According to the American Psychological Association, the APA, being a traditional man is now considered on par with a mental disorder. Now this is the writer's perspective. For the first time ever, the APA has issued a set of guidelines for how to approach men and boys specifically within counseling practice. The new APA protocols for mental health professionals working with men, boys, men and boys released in August, uh, which you can read in entirety by looking up this article. Recently, uh, the statement finds that, quote, research finds that traditional masculinity is on the whole harmful. Quote, the main thrust of the subsequent research is that traditional masculinity marked by stoicism, competitiveness, dominance, and aggression is on the whole harmful. The January January article from the APA goes on to read, men socialized in this way are less likely to engage in healthy behaviors. Um, So um, what is gender in the 2010s? Asked Ryan McDermott, Ph.D. psychologist at the University of South Alabama. Uh, he helped write new write the new men's guidelines. It no longer just is just this male female binary. According to McDermott, boys and men identify as gay, bisexual, or transgender face higher than average levels of hostility and pressure to conform to masculine norms. Um, the particular area of psychology features prominently in the APA's recommendation in working with men and boys. Gender and sexual minorities, too, reads the article, must grapple with societal views of masculinity. This is an ever-shifting territory. When Levant and Rabinowitz launched the guideline and drafting process in, the two th- in 2005, only Massachusetts recognized same-sex marriage. Today, transgender issues are at the forefront of the cult- cultural conversation. Um, so when you hear that... Uh, uh, so Rob Rob Dreyer at the American Conservative said this move is mostly about the psych- psycholo- psychologizing the gelding of American males. I don't trust Ryan McDermott to decide what is and what is not healthy masculinity. And uh, I think there is a real war. I, I do think that, uh, you know, when you hear, um, you know, things like, where was it, uh, you know, not, we're not ta- sexism, patriarchy, and male privilege seem to be behind the new guidelines. Uh, masculinity marked by stoicism, mm-hmm. competitive competitiveness, mm-hmm. dominance, mm-hmm. and aggression. Mm-hmm. Um, there's good ways and bad ways to look at those things, right? Like mm-hmm. aggressiveness is bad, or dominance is bad. If you're watching Surviving R. Kelly, which I finished last night, it, it is a stunning piece of work. Uh, it is everything that is wrong with um, a, a lot of things in society. I think uh, you guys haven't watched it, have you? No. No. Okay. Uh, I would recommend that you as parents watch Surviving R. Kelly on Lifetime or Hulu and then show it to your girls when they're age appropriate because it's going to save a lot of lives. And you're going to see the repeated – you're going to see the the consistent uh, – I, w- I want to do a show on it, so I won't go too far into it, but – Like, R. Kelly is a man who is uh, currently keeping a cult of women held hostage uh, against their will. He he married Aaliyah at 15. He had the the infamous P tape with a 14-year-old girl and another one of his uh, ladies. He he somehow didn't go to jail for that. Uh, You have a guy who has just an amazing long track record of doing these horrific things and everybody in the music industry and in Hollywood and the public knows it. The black community knows it. You know, he's still singing at churches. He's still singing at the at the Olympics. He's still selling records. He's still being promoted until finally the Me Too movement in the last couple of years, where the mute R. Kelly thing has come along, and people finally somehow have ga- gathered the courage to say, "No, this isn't okay." 
uh, uh, human beings are a cowardly species. It isn't until somebody stands up and says, this is wrong, that the rest of the herd starts to follow them, which is why you should never be shy about speaking your beliefs because you never know who's going to stand up and follow. You feel like you're all alone, but the second you stand up and say, I believe this thing, uh, millions of people stand up and go, yeah, me too. Uh, and uh, I look at the R. Kelly situation as like, that's toxic masculinity. There's a guy who promotes sexual promiscuity, who promotes dominance over women, who promotes a lifestyle married to wealth and fame and uh, just in in, uh, in a grotesque way, he's dominating women by keeping them prisoner. He's competitive because he'll stop at nothing to stop his enemies. Aggression towards anyone that shows him sort of any harm or th these girls disobey him, he hits them. Like that's to me is toxic masculinity. But being aggressive in terms of saying uh, a, a term, a, a point of aggression for me, it feels aggressive to say, I've had 15 years of understanding podcasting and broadcasting and building digital media mm -hmm. brands. It feels aggressive to say, I charge $120 an hour as a consulting fee or $60 an hour. It, it, to me, it's like, you're my friend, but listen, my time's worth this. That to me feels aggressive because I'm not necessarily an aggressive man. Um, dominance, I, I feel that I, on a daily basis, need to dominate myself. I need to capture my inner demons and work through those things and, and become a better man. It's not my job to dominate other people, but I, I want to dominate my job, you know? Um, See, be, I'm competitive with myself. I think there, there are, these are masculine traits that are being made, uh, the, 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 uh, like Dreher said, trying to geld us. Okay. So, go ahead. Right. But I think that that's honestly bad framing because aggressiveness, yeah, that's bad. But assertiveness, you're standing up for your own value. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, dominance, bad. Being authoritative, because it's a realm in which you are knowledgeable and have authority, that's good. That's something that you should assert yourself as an authority. Well, so let's look up the definition. So I'm just looking at the Google definition here now and pow for dominance. Power and influence over others. So with power and influence over others, you have a responsibility to use that correctly. You you know when you have when you have dominance you, in the classical sense, you have that, and then an aggression, hostile or violent behavior, or attitudes towards another, readiness to attack or confront. So I agree on aggressiveness. I, I'm right. uh, I'm not for that that particular thing. My thing with it, right. Is the framing of the is the whole framing of the word of saying that it is toxic masculinity? Why can't it just be a toxic behavior? Now you may say that you know these are these gender terms, but I'm sorry to me that I t I it shuts me down when I hear stuff like that, especially with Paul was saying that men are being attacked by on all sides from this because as any single guys are out there, I'm sure they have hit their get their share of you know, females of the species being toxic and no one really talking about it. I'm sure they've been hit with a foodie call once or twice and it's only single guys that really talk about that. Foodie call? Yeah, foodie call. Yeah. Girls who only swipe right on you just because you know, they're hungry. And, and it exists, yeah. Yeah. I think, the rise, I think the rise of sugar baby culture mm -hmm. and economic, uh, yeah. economic manipulation as a BDSM category uh i think uh, what is the arrangements eh, bdsm the, that's a those that's are a voluntary, voluntary right. contract it's People not manipulative it's not manipulative no, well, right. right. yeah it's it's known as financial domination yeah, yeah. that's dollars. the term yeah fine right yeah what, but you sign up for that you seeking, know exactly it, what you're getting is it seeking arrangements like i i i just People well, are people are free to do what they want, but correct. I also think that uh but the manipulation and the fraud is what i'm talking right, about right. that's what toxic you can that's the toxic part about it. You know, it's not that like if you're coming like, hey, Abe, this is what's going on. This is like that. It's the you know, it's the the you, people have been manipulated. That's what people get upset when they see certain things is like you're manipulating people because you're presenting yourself as something else. And in reality, you're not. 
And right. that's the people. That's people have have problems with that. And that's what I see more of when someone says, "Well, like this talks about like, well, no, because R. Kelly is usually." Um, I haven't watched the show, but usually guys like this in these cults or stuff like that, they present, they manipulate the people and present them themselves as a caregiver, as someone in their life. Yeah, absolutely. That's so how you reel them in. Yeah, yeah, it's manipulation. Just manipulate, right. manipulate, manipulate, and that's what I see as toxic. Yeah, the the bad intent. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, but like, I think it really does. A disservice when we frame very healthy behaviors such as assertiveness as something that they aren't necessarily uh, as an aggressive you know going to your boss and demanding not even demanding asking for a raise something that it takes a lot of assertiveness mm-hmm and then we turn around and we frame that same assertiveness, something that advances that person, as aggression, which, to me, aggression is something that is deleterious to others. Deleterious, yeah. 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 It's harmful to others, for those of you who went to public school. Yes. Showing your education, Paul. I, old, Ivy, old Ivy League Copeland. Yeah. Uh, no, it's, I love the word deleterious. Yes. Yeah. No, I think that's that's exactly right. There is, um, there there is. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna say. Uh, go ahead, Perry. Oh, you keep going. I'm I'm just gonna parrot it. I'm just gonna direct this back to the commercial once you finish this. Okay. <laughs> uh, I may take us in a real weird place. Um, Crap baskets. So. Uh, I, I think because of my experience, like if you go back and listen to Amanda's story, episode 141-ish, or the cost w- episode, it's sort of a repeat. I'm going to set up r- new episodes with those guys. Like having lived through an experience with a best friend who was being hunted by a man and having that best friend go, uh, you know, when you say this, you sound like him and you're being controlling and manipulative. I think it is really important for guys, especially younger guys who aren't necessarily good with women to really latch on to their female friends, seek nothing but friendship, first of all, and to, to like, I, like if you're talking to a girl and you're not good with women, like get with a girlfriend that you know is emotionally stable. That's the key. Mm-hmm. And say like, what do you think of this? Like, what am I doing wrong here? And she's going to point out so many red flags, and that really helped That helped me a lot. There's another book called Mate by Jeffrey Miller and Tucker Max, and they did a Mating, mating Grounds podcast, and I, it's for both men and women. It's great. Like, where they really talked about the laws of attraction, and it's not in, like, that, you know, skeezy, the game, sort of, oh, I'm going to neg you, because that, that's not what works. What works is being the best version of yourself. Like, if you're a man or a woman and you want to be successful in life, Start with improving yourself. You will in, you will immediately start getting better at dating, get, getting better at your job, getting better at being a dad, getting better at being a father, getting the uh, same thing. Some people are dads and some people are fathers. <laughs> uh, this is going back to the sugar daddy thing. Yeah, you're either uh, father or you're daddy. <laughs> go back to the what? You're a better husband. Um, you as a man, I, I, I I'm going to say this, and I don't mean this in a way that is upholding the patriarchy. I think that a lot of women, when I say this to them, they agree with me, but it's hard when you have these conversations in public because sometimes people want to twist it against their biases. Men are supposed to be leaders. And I think in a relationship or in a workplace or in life, you're supposed to lead. And to lead, you have to have an understanding of what is a good moral compass. And I think what I like about this commercial is that it is saying, you know what the right thing to do is. It's already inherent in you. If you see a child being picked on, you should intervene. You shouldn't allow another boy to hit another boy and violate his person because boys will be boys. Like, you're not supposed to just let kids beat each other. Like, they're <laughs> if, if you want to know why our society is violent, it's like, uh, I, our friend uh, Sarah Brady Wagner, she's a nanny, and she's like, it's sort of fun to teach three-year-old boys that they can hit each other. They just have to ask permission first. And to watch these boys go, may I hit you? 
Yes. <laughs> you know, because men are inherently aggressive, and they. But you have to learn as a child, as as a man, that you you have to channel that and and funnel that in a good way, and you have to be a leader. And I think men are laying down as leaders. I think we are failing at leading our society. We're failing at leading our families. We're failing at leading our movements. We're failing at leading everything. And we're outsourcing the leading to politicians, to our women. I think that uh, women are just tired. Like, women are fed up. And I think they have every right to be. I think women are tired of coming home and doing uh, everything. They, they feel they're doing everything. And, uh, but at the same time, I also think that men aren't getting enough of a break. And I know that this sounds like cognitive dissonance, but think about it this way. I was in a group chat with some friends, and uh, the, the women folk in the chat, with their boyfriends were in the chat, which was awkward, were com the, the women folk were complaining that these guys don't do housework. They're lazy. Mm -hmm. They play video games. They're uh -huh. they're do nothing, good nothing. Uh, why do I have to teach a man how to how, teach a man how to be a man? And I said, you know what? You're you're really unfair. You're being unfair to men because millennial men, starting with millennial men, are more willing to work on these problems in society than any generation before. Saying, I know there's a problem. I want to know how I can help fix it, as opposed to shut up broad <laughs> or with a madman world or you know I, 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 like talk back to me but you you have to understand we're in a fundamental shift of societal norms in so many different areas of life and the dynamics between men and women i think is one area where things are completely different than they were two generations ago and nobody's having the conversation about how to, to how to even like arrange housework right so your grandfather you know, the, the, the greatest generation guy, that guy didn't do any housework. Did your grandfather's, Harry, yours may be different. What the heck? Are you sure? Are uh, you sure? I, Are you sure? Yes. I'm All not right. saying every, so but by and large. You're right. You're right. No one, ch yes. right. No one chopped that wood. The roof, you know, no, magically I'm didn't saying, leak on its own. I'm the saying outside of the house got painted. There the grass were, got there cut. Were, there were boy chores and there were girl chores. Yeah. Yeah. And now... I find it, and I find it hilarious when someone says, "Like, hey, you're not, you know, keep up with this." Like, dude, laundry is easy compared to cutting grass. I, I'll do laundry all day than cut grass. Yeah, I, you know, I remember like, um, it's just this weekend. Lacey's like, "Give me the snowblower. I want to do the driveway. You want to do the driveway? Sure can." She's out there for like a few seconds with that snowblower. <laughs> And, you know, I just hear it stop. You know, she's just stuck. It's jammed. She tried to get the, because she ran over some leaves in it. And it was just like, <laughs> this is funny. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm in there just folding like, oh, this is, look at that. It's great. It's right. awesome. Drink another margarita. It should also be noted that your wife, you make your wife do all the boy chores. Yeah, yeah. Especially when she asks. Right. Yeah. But that's the other thing is this communication there. Just bring it up. Right. Did you talk to him about this? Did you ask about and that's this? A, that's always like the first question I ask. Like, did you bring this up? No. Well, how'd you bring, uh, or if it's yes, how'd you bring this up? Well, I've been yelling at him for five years. Uh, I don't mm -hmm. know. If you just belittle somebody, they don't typically listen to you. But here, let me finish my point. So okay, sorry. by and large, I'm looking at larger trends, okay? Now, when I do this, it makes libertarians crazy because we're individualists. Mm -hmm. And you have to understand that there are larger trends. Why does medicine exist? Because a lot of, like, I have this little pain on my thumbnail, right to the right of my thumbnail, and it's very tender, and and it's has a it, there's a medical condition known as like a swollen cuticle. And it's because there is a pattern of human beings getting swollen cuticles. Uh, there, uh, human beings are pack animals. We are. It's why when you go out on Friday night, look at all the North Fests. We we mimic each other. Okay, so so there are larger patterns that you can kind of grab onto, and I want to grab onto some of those patterns to outline this this conversation that I think needs to be had. So your grandfathers didn't do a lot of housework. They may have done the gir the boy chores, but they were you'd be damned if you caught a vacuum cleaner in your grandpa's hand. And he probably didn't even know how to, right? And so then, and, and he didn't need to because my grandmothers, both of my grandmothers stayed home. You know, they assisted, like, my, my sister's a stay-at-home mom. That is more than a full-time job. Like, my sister works her butt off. She may be at home all day, but she is at home all day with two screaming toddlers and has to keep the house clean. Now, she does her best. We used to call her Messy Jessie. 
but she she is she does a lot of work like that that's a tremendous amount of work like he goes to work he is the breadwinner and then she does the housework like they have a traditional family unit now i have seen like my nieces are perfect right like they're they're the best so i i look at that and i go okay this this seems to work right mm-hmm. um n- now our parents m- moms had to start going to work mm-hmm because all of a sudden the Fed started inflating the currency, wages stopped rising, and all of a sudden, oh, oh crap, we need more money. So mm-hmm. both parents started to work. And your dad's held on to those norms of, I'll do the boy chores, you do the girl chores. And then all of a sudden the mom is doing a lot of chores and working, and it's, and it's a shift, right? But there's no conversation about how to deal with all these different duties. Millennial, millennials come along and go, yeah, I agree, you shouldn't have to do all the cooking and cleaning, uh, but I also think that a lot of millennial men have no idea how to do any of this because you're, fa- I grew up with a dad that was a janitor. So like, I know how to keep a place clean, but like, I don't know. Harry's weird, but like, <laughs> uh, like I believe my parents had indentured servants. Like they had kids, so they didn't have to do housework. They had us. So we did the boy and girl chores, but I think there needs to be a conversation about even those little simple things like. I don't think I don't think the boomer and Gen X generation really had that conversation of how do we balance all these things that need to be done around the house and make it fair and equitable and I don't know how to do any of this like I like my, my like I don't know how to do a lot of uh a lot of uh, uh, anyways go ahead like am i making sense like you do, are do you... but uh boomers re- and gen xers a little bit um removed home ec and shop out of high school so right. a lot of millennial men have no clue whatsoever right. how to build or do anything and or too much pride or, and too much to pride way to too say much, anything. Yeah, yeah. way too much pride is to say that you know you know it's only like a few you know crafts and trades that that will cut a guy's pride. Like if you're a mechanic, and you work in that thing, you'll cut your pride very quickly to add it, ask a more seasoned mechanic on how to fix something. Right. Or if you're an IT, you'll learn to ask questions very quickly. Um, those are my two trades. There's probably more, but these are the two I'm more familiar with. But um, we are what, getting. Well, hold on, we are getting so many new people because of the title of this particular episode, which we'll get to the yellow vest later. But it's nothing but French dudes. Going worst cam girls ever. <laughs> <laughs> so y- yeah, I think. Uh, <laughs> I, I, but this, but go the, ahead. One thing is, I will. Uh, but if I make a wage and I don't want to do my chore because I outsource it with money, I'm still doing that chore. So I don't want to cut grass. So I pay someone to do it. Yeah. So I can sit on my butt and play that video game for that hour. I'm still doing that chore. The chore is getting done. It may look like my feet are up, but I'm doing that chore technically. Yeah. I'm just trading my time easily, just like cleaning out the gutters or doing stuff like that. They're still doing these different chores around the house. And my other advice for any guys for communication's sake, remember, always ask to switch. It's my favorite one. Right. It's my favorite move. Explain that. It's um, I, I don't like I have to do, I have to cook, I have to clean. It's like, ask to switch. Ask to switch. Right. I'll do the cooking, cleaning, cleaning and laundry, da, 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 and you go out and do the lawn. The lawn. lawn da, 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 da. Right. And the same thing if you have, which, you know, it, and nothing, it's just more of a commu- opening up communication and helping someone see the other side. Sometimes it takes someone walking in the other shoes to see, to actually appreciate the work that someone else does. Yeah. Just because, like, you know, it's like, well, it's just cutting grass. Well, if you're using a push mower, you're cutting grass for an hour. Dude, that's you. You, so, you burn so many calories right. just pushing grass. Turn your turn your pedometer on as you walk around. You, und- I think I got up to a mile one time. But the other thing, when it comes to switching, is if like being a stay at home um, parent is a lot of work. You were you did it for a yeah, while. I did it for a while. Right when it's a lot of work. It is a full time job. But if you feel that you're not getting right the respect for your job. Look, look your partner in the eye and ask to switch. Right. I'll get the job you stay at home. But if you're not prepared to do that, then, you know, it's more of a, like, then what are we really doing? Yeah. Have, a, have, this, have this conversation better because most people aren't willing to do the switch. Yeah, so I think my larger point is that uh, millennial men are, like, on this very small thing, right, that's, I think, illustrative. I was like, you, you these friends who were complaining, I was like, do you not realize how lucky you are? Because, like, at least there can be a conversation that they're willing to help. 
you just may not be treating them with enough respect to understand that they're too embarrassed to say, I don't know how to clean a toilet. You know, it's like little things like that where nobody ever trained them. And so, and I think we're just getting, we're letting like these, well, men are all, like we grew up with the image of the worthless dad who was just a piece Mm -hmm. of garbage, who was helpless and feckless and like Homer Simpson and Al Bundy and, Mm -hmm. you know, and I think that that has kind of seeped into culture where women, it's girl power, they're badasses, they can do anything, there's going to be a woman president, but then guys, you're lazy, you're just, you're not leaders, you're worth, you know, like, yeah. th- there is, and and I think we have to start picking out the positive things about men in the 21st century and start highlighting some of those. The problem is that when you do that, when you're Jordan Peterson and you come along and you say, here's a, here's a structure. Here is a framework for you as a man to be a better man. Mm-hmm. The harpies in the society start s- writing horrible hit pieces on a guy who has changed the life of millions of men around the world through empowering them to be better partners, to be better men, not not to preserve that toxic masculinity of R. Kelly or John Wayne or any of that, but to be an emotionally connected partner who is willing to do the work, who is willing to actually have conversations. Um, The other thing when it comes to (laughs) when you find out from this whole switch thing, right, is that you bring an also, you can also bring a different set of eyes to the table because the way guys think. Right. Guys, for some reason, well, the majority of the guys I've run into, we think power tools. Right. I'm sorry. I deal with a lot of mechanics or people who are mechanically engineer minded. We always go to power tools, so everything's a power tool, right? And everything's a load base, and we processes. Right. So a lot of times, like, when I took over the cleaning, it was like, okay, the process here is just wrong. That's the problem. So I went out and got a bigger dishwasher, a bigger clothes washer. I went and got, like, a power tool thing to clean the toilet faster and the, and the bathroom, so I just sit there with a power drill, <laughs> gets everything going, and half the time. Half the time, more tools. That SNL commercial about the stay-at-home dad and that massive tools and stuff like that, dude, that actually, I was like, man, I wanted that. I want to ride on a vacuum cleaner. I'd use that sucker. You love <laughs> you love <laughs> new <laughs> things. Power tools. You love to complicate. You're Mr. Complication. How hard is it to keep a little brush next to your toilet? You, you know, s- you, you know save what? thirty I got seconds. A stick with a you put a battery in. <laughs> Done. And shit water going everywhere. You wipe everything down. You're the one who's got your toothbrush next to the shit water and don't lower your uh, freaking seat. That's disgusting. I bet I bring a black light in there on your toothbrush and that's disgusting. I actually, I disinfect my toothbrush, my loofah. Good. You I dis- should. I, my razor. I do. A lot. Yep. I do that all the time with uh, the rubbing alcohol. Hit that, hit that, kill off those germs, peroxide, whatever. You got to disinfect. It's also, important. black lights are very good to teach your sons to clean the bathroom correctly. All right, I don't want to get. I don't. <laughs> all right, glows under black black yes, lights. Those boys peeing everywhere. Make them I, see their urine. Hey, worked on me with my mom. All right, did you clean the bathroom? Sure did. Click. No, you didn't. No, how well, did you get it up there? How did you even get it up there? Well, I think you raise a good point, and that's part of what I'm trying to say is let more understanding, less blame, and accusation. Yeah. You know, like check your bias i think that you made you raised a really good point there where uh, and i think men need to see this too that when you invite women into traditionally male places they start to change things but that change can be good too because women have many great qualities like mm-hmm. they're more empathetic i i think they are uh, they're more sensitive they 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 add a lot to the workplace. They add a lot safety to safety minded. Safety minded. There there's just different ways, different modes of thinking. I think we do ourselves a disservice by saying there are no differences between men and women. I reject that wholly. Um, I, I understand and appreciate and believe that we should be respectful of people who um, may, you know. I did a podcast called Creating Maya with somebody who transitioned from a male to a female. And it was a learning experience for me in tolerance and understanding in appreciation for somebody who I don't understand how they think or why they think the ways that they do or the changes they want to make, but it doesn't matter. Like, this is a person who wants to be called Maya. So as a person who wants to respect another human being, I must be empathetic and understand their struggle and try to see where they're coming from and call them Maya and call her her. You know, it doesn't. It doesn't hurt you to be nice, <laughs> you know. And I, I just, I like all these fourteen-year-old boys on Instagram. 
who follow Ben Shapiro who are just like, like with trans, it's just like inf- inflammatory. You just go like, what? Like, why don't you actually meet a trans person and understand the hell that they're going through? But I think your your point is well taken, Harry, where you invited a, in your home a male to do the traditionally female roles, and then all of a sudden things were done differently but maybe more effectively because you said, hey, this way that it's always been done by our parents probably isn't effective. Let's do it this way. I think male-dominated industries or environments can benefit from – having females in traditionally male places and the environments can kind of change. Correct. Yeah. It's better for me. And it's just a way of thinking like to me, I'd rather run the dishwasher five times to clean like two dishes other than sitting in the sink going like this. Cause I could just hit a button, walk off. Uh, uh, yeah. I make it cook. What? I, uh, walk Mr. off. Mr. Conservation. It's water. It's water. Okay. It's water. So, but <laughs> And coal but power. I, I also think there needs to be, <laughs> there needs to be spaces in society where men can be men, and there can be conversations where it's exclusively like our ma- our chats. We have one chat that is is all men, and the conversation can be a little different in there because it's it's like it's just different. Not to- supposed to talk about the top secret patriarchy chat. You're right. <laughs> all right, it's two I, merits. I'm more offended that I wasn't invited to that. Harry's one, not in it anymore. <laughs> What? You're basically not in it. Yeah, I'm not in it. Anymore. You're not. You, you yeah, didn't. You didn't even know about the big news this week, which I should have mentioned way earlier than this. Yeah, no one cares. Um, moving on. Back to the Gillette commercial. One with Sarah talking about the guy. Like, yeah, in that commercial, when I saw the boys doing that, and I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. We're gonna do this sportingly, one at a time, and only if we all agree to this. And we're gonna bring some rules. H- hitting each other. Yeah, we're gonna bring some rules. Gloves, helmets, please. Mouth guards, go. Well, yeah. everyone agrees. No one agrees, then back off. But it also felt like they stole the scene from um, Karate Kid too. <sighs> I, that's what I. Sorry, that's what I saw when he was when the dad jumped into that fight scene in the, in the Gillette commercial. I was like, is this Karate Kid? <laughs> what? I'm not the only one that saw that. Fine then, well, whatever. But but I did like the commercial. For, uh, um, that's I. I did have an issue with the guy and the stereotypical, like, sitting behind the barbecue going, boys will be boys, boys will be boys, boys will be like, yeah, so, sometimes. Yeah, we saw that with Kavanaugh. I mean, it, you know, if Kavanaugh was guilty of what he was accused of, there's no boys will be boys about it. It doesn't matter if he was 17. He was intentionally inflicting harm on another person. He Correct. was using violence against someone, and he should be held accountable at no matter what age, in yeah. my opinion. Correct. Most people who say that is usually when a, go- a boy get dirty. Right, they get dirty. Right. They play with bugs. Um, they like just do s- or do something destructive of their own toys or, or something. Right, my, my That's family boys will be boys. My family's in for a world of hurt. We've had two perfect, sweet baby angels, mm-hmm. and two girls, and uh, there's a boy on the way in you? in the family. Uh, my brother is oh. having a boy, and uh, boys just have a level of energy that is so much more than than girls. Like they are hell bent on suicide at every minute of the day when they're three. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, they're they're just there's a different there's a difference. There just is. Yep. It's a different role biologically, right. and that's for a quarter of a million years. That's what has kept the species going. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll follow hashtag boy mom on Instagram, and it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> so, d- do uh, to to go back to the commercial because mm-hmm. I, I don't want to ask this question because it'll divert us too far again. Because yeah, it's nine now. To go back to the question, oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, shit. Uh, to yeah. we haven't even started the second topic. Nope. Um, uh, maybe we ought to do two shows. You think we should split them into two shows? Uh, it's going long. It's a long week for me. All right. Uh, so here's the thing. Uh, what I liked about the commercial. The advertisement of it aside, uh, which we'll talk about in in our final little segment here, um, the the thing the the thing that I was amazed about bo- with R. Kelly is that nobody spoke up. Yeah, and you know there are times when speaking up and saying things like, "I had a situation today where there's just somebody around a thing I'm involved in." And I just think that this person is a dangerous person, and he makes people feel uncomfortable. And I'm in a less powerful position than other people. And I made myself known. 
and I got a little pushback for it and a little bit of it's not your place. But, like, I just think men need at a certain point to start saying, like, hey, this guy's not allowed to come to the party anymore, and it's because he makes all the women feel uncomfortable. Yeah. Or when you're out with your friends, there's a difference between a joke and this guy's just being downright disrespectful and harass harassing people. And I think men, part of leading is standing up and saying, for the more uh, um, agreeable people in our society or the less powerful, part of being a man is standing up and saying, this isn't right, this needs to be fixed, or we need, as a group, to take a, lo- a harder look at this particular individual or this behavior or this thing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't need think we need to fundamentally change society, but I think men have lost their sense of justice and we need to regain it. I think we have lost the idea that the powerful have to stand up for the powerless instead of the powerful getting more power. And uh, that that isn't just I- in a populist frame of mind where Wall Street needs to come down. And be, it's in our everyday lives. Like There have to be examples in your guys' life where you see the powerful picking on the powerless and nobody says anything. Correct. Yeah. And I always feel... And you are right. Once you start saying it yourself, I've like, um, I've seen it at work too. And I've just when someone say something and they everyone just kind of laugh it off, like, "Hey, that's uncool." Honestly, you change your words. You right. Know, I see what you're trying to say, but the words you're using is offensive. Right. You know, there's, you know, we're all working professionals here. We're all engineers. You know, you can you can think up another word. Right. You know, it's happened on the show. Things that we've said on the air, people have come back and said. Hey, that wasn't cool. I know you were kidding, but, uh, you know, and we lost a co-host over it. Like, I was just downright, uh, I thought I was being funny, and Seth thought I was being disrespectful, you know, and I was wrong. Like, it wasn't, he didn't think it was funny, he wasn't in on the joke, Mm -hmm. and so therefore it wasn't cool, you know, and it probably wasn't cool even if he was in on the joke. So, you have to, uh, but you have to have people to stand up and go, hey, uh, come on. So, um the the other part of it is uh, th- that we're being sold something here, like commer- like yeah, corporations are using positive messages like this. You can look at it two ways: a, they have a platform and the money to push that positive message, so good. We need some corporations to take social responsibility, or b, it's a cynical ploy for them to get conversation on podcasts for free yeah i I just want to let to lower their prices um (laughs) i love the razors but i don't shave enough to buy them so i use i go through uh i actually use harry's razors now i'm a harry's man myself yep they last long enough yep um actually got like i used i hated the razors then i watched um uh, your boss uh shave with it and i copied his technique and you know it shaved better with it yeah yeah excellent yeah all right, so final thoughts on this issue before we move on to the next subject. I'm just sorry. I just weirded out. I just realized your boss showed me how to shave. <laughs> next. Did he wrap his arms around <laughs> you when he did it? Or? Well, I didn't shave when I was with my dad and living in the house. I didn't start shaving until I left right. the house. So, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, no, I, I just have a little bit of a problem with a major corporation weighing in on political issues the same way that I don't necessarily want to hear my favorite band's political views. I, to me, it's a time and a place sort of thing, and maybe it's the time and the place for them to be involved as a corporation, but I don't know. Yeah. I think we're just past the point where your favorite brand is just trying to advertise to you they're just this is just re- this is society now everything is political everything is a message everything has meaning and it, and it's partly because millennials who attach everything they do to meaning are now taking a greater share of the workload and the decision making roles in their in their corporations and in business and uh, we fundamentally think that if you're going to do something it ought to have a purpose yeah i i just I'm not quite sure how I feel about all that. So. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, I'm glad we could have Mine's you on to say that so. you weren't quite sure. <laughs> That's great analysis. I'm yeah. just not sure. No, it's fine. I'm I'm teasing you. I, you should say I'm not sure. If I'm honest, I was distracting him with the always campaign of the throw like a girl and run like a girl campaign. Can you please stop playing the waifu game in the middle of the podcast, by the way? Uh, no. Okay. All right. Um. So... 
Paul Joseph Watson is uh, connected to Infowars and uh, is it says he's a, cons- a former conspiracy theorist. Uh, and I will I after Trump won started watching all of the new right alt right all those people. You know, Paul Joseph Watson fundamentally rejects the term alt right, so I will not call him that. The New York Times would call him that, but I think that like. Uh, Richard Spencer is alt right, he, they, he, but this is the new right, right? Okay, so go ahead. Yeah, because Paul Joseph Watson isn't alt right. Alt right isn't right wing. Right. Paul Joseph Watson is actually right wing. Alt right. writers are lefties who want to call themselves right wing. Right, who are fascists. Who right. fascists? Yeah, right. they're left wingers. So uh, he's a controversial figure, and he's not necessarily somebody that uh, that, that we would normally play on the show. But I do. I have watched a lot of his videos. I've watched a lot of Alex Jones. I've watched a lot of uh, Count Dankula. You know, we played those these people on the on the show in the past because sometimes they have something that I think is important or interesting to say. I know Luke Radowski. I'm. I never have heard that name. He did a great video of him actually, you know, like down there in France and in Venezuela. So right, I'll send you some. So I don't know if I want to play the video because it's seven minutes long. I want to kind of break down some of the points, but we probably should. But here's my thing. I don't want to play this video because I don't want people to think that I agree with everything the guy has ever said because I don't know everything he's ever said, and I probably wouldn't like a lot of what he may have said. And I like some of what he has said. And, and I wonder if there is a space in the world. And I, I attended this conference online this past weekend um, held by the Free Thought Project, which you know a lot of people in the audience would consider fringy or conspiracy theorist, and I'm the type of person that will literally talk to anybody. I don't consider myself a conspiracy theorist. I have one former listener who's still very angry at me and sending me emails and documents about 9/11 because I don't believe in in the 9/11 truth conspiracies or whatever. Um, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I will. I have changed my mind on that particular term. I used to mock people with it. I used to label people with it. And over the last year, I realized I'm being a useful idiot. When I use that term to diminish a person's being or every word that comes out of their mouth, I'm actually being uh, part of the censorship problem. You know, because Paul Joseph Watson on the Yellow Vest stuff, I thought, had some interesting things, and I wanted to fact check it, which is what we've done. Um, so the, the reality in this day and age is that if you play something like this, you're automatically associated with, oh, this is just a person who's promoting the ideas of Paul Joseph Watson, mm-hmm. when in reality, after we play this video or parts of this video, we're then going to... We fact checked the heck out of it. Sam Schultz did a great job with the research on this, and I wanted to because uh, I watched it and I went, "Okay, is this true?" Because there are things in here where you kind of go, mm, "Jump to conclusions," or this is a compelling argument from a compelling person. But what's really happening in France right now? Like, is it as authoritarian as as they may say? So I, I'm going to play a little, just so you have a flavor of it. But I. I want I want to open it up to you guys. When you play something like this, do you immediately forever in the minds of your audience you you turn them off from you and they associate you with these people or do you think that there is a space where we as a society can can touch the third rail and examine the words of this person or this group of people cuz we like to me Ocasio-Cortez that Green New Deal episode was stunning. That is a far more radical person than Alex Jones is. <laughs> like, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, is, it, her ideas are absolutely frightening. Mm-hmm. You know, Alex Jones, I don't think, has an ideology. I think he just has a bunch of feelings. <laughs> yeah. But, like, he's he's the goat in society, but then this person's celebrated, and you go... This doesn't this doesn't add up. But like we'll take the left. We can talk about the left without penalty. Mm-hmm. But you can't talk about anybody who's on the right that is influencing a lot of people. Right. You know, I mean, uh, am I crazy to play this? Am I going to forever ruin we are libertarians? Uh, y- y- you've tried to ruin it in the past with <laughs> various clothing choices. So yeah, I doubt this will do anything. <laughs> okay. Do any harm, Paul? 
You're you're much much less of a. You know, I I really want to give some credit to our audience that you know we can examine the ideas of another group without them assuming that we've adopted adopting them. them yes yeah. you're right our audiences the, it's adults we're going to treat our audience like adults or semi adults well no it, our audience are adults but we're semi adults oh, okay right all right so this is Paul Joseph Watson a YouTuber and uh he works for Infowars so here's what he had to say about this video is titled, What They're Not Telling You About the Yellow Vests. The French government is so terrified of the Yellow Vest movement, they're debating new laws that would criminalize all unauthorized protests. Meaning you would need government permission to protest the government, otherwise known as dictatorship or martial law. Protest leaders are now being handcuffed and abducted in the night, like something out of Stasi East Germany. Yellow Vest organizer Eric Drouet was arrested and faces trial for, quote, organizing an undeclared demonstration while meeting with friends at a restaurant. Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3, 2011. Paris, 2019. They look identical. The city looks like a screenshot from an apocalyptic video game. Every weekend, something's gone drastically wrong. On Saturday, Khan looked more like a battlefield than a city. The Virgin Antifa rioter versus the Chad French rioter. Hides behind a mask, poses no real threat to authority, just breaks shit with no purpose. Sports a sexy yellow vest, caused actual change, breaks shit because he's fed up with taxes. Now you know I don't advocate violence. And this guy claimed he was angry because his wife got tear gassed. But when Christoph Dettinger, despite being targeted by the media and authorities, doxxed and having his home raided, becomes an overnight icon, you know whose side the public are on. I don't want to see Paris torn up, but when Antifa attacks banks, the left cheers. When yellow vests do the same, it's a dark harbinger of a fascist takeover. But President Macron is a globalist authoritarian, and the only way authoritarians know how to react to disobedience is with violence. But the underpaid and overworked French police will eventually join their fellow countrymen and the king will have no clothes. As Tom Luongo writes, the Yellow Vest movement is coffin nails for the EU because it illustrates how the EU is a scam and all of its policies were designed to do exactly what it's done. Impoverish the working classes, enrich the aristocracy, and enforce it through a Byzantine bureaucracy that makes the world of Terry Gilliam's Brazil look like a Toyota factory floor. Now yellow vest activists are tearing down EU flags. When he was elected, Macron was hailed as the savior of globalism. Little over a year later, and his approval rating is at 23%, while his citizens are using forklift trucks to smash into the Ministry of Finance and Economy building. Meanwhile, the establishment has set in motion a character assassination of the small but growing yellow vest movement in the UK. Ramona MP Anna Subri was called, oh my god, she was called a Nazi, Subri is a Nazi. Right. prompting a contrived hysterical media narrative that new laws need to be passed to prevent the abuse of politicians. Because Anna Subri would never smear ordinary working class people as Nazis or fascists. Would she? These are fascists, 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 fascists. Owen Jones is the voice of the working class. These gentlemen were just the wrong kind of working class. Yeah, where was the outrage when Jacob Rees-Mogg's children were being abused by vile left-wing thugs? Your daddy, your daddy's a totally horrible thug. How about Nigel Farage's family being repeatedly attacked and abused? So there is a real double standard here that those of us that have taken on the establishment have to endure the abuse. Those within the establishment get a taste of it and suddenly they want the law changed. The left has been pulling stunts like that for years. But as soon as one establishment MP gets a bit of lip, you all freak out and wet the bed. Give me a break. A right-wing AFD politician in Germany is beaten almost to death by left-wing terrorists and it barely makes the news. While every screaming top headline for two days was about someone being mean to Anna Subri, and it was all part of a coordinated scheme to digitally assassinate one of the leaders of the UK Yellow Vest movement. Social media accounts banned, PayPal accounts deleted, doxing, journalists harassing their elderly parents. Thousands of jihadists roaming our streets every day, people being stabbed to death 
every single day. Gotta get those dangerous 13 year old girls off the streets though. Then there's this bizarre footage out of Holland, which shows a woman wearing a yellow vest being dragged away from a baby stroller by police. The incident was apparently some kind of police training or social experiment, but it's disturbing nonetheless. Basically, the yellow vest is the new anonymous mask. It's a unifying emblem for anti-establishment fervor across Europe. And it seems the only thing more provocative than yellow vests is German women who wear their hair in braids. We are now here at the train station Chemnitz and we were really stopped by the police. She said, here we are at the train station, we were stopped by the police. I was really asked, and I was just asked by the police what my political opinions were. What I have a political opinion. They asked if I had right-wing political views because of my braids. I am totally shocked. There's speculation raging, which is unconfirmed at this point, that governments are already conspiring with mainstream media networks to release pre-written stories if tensions escalate that will do everything possible to minimize the chance of events being seen as a European spring. We've already seen mainstream TV channels in France photoshopping and censoring anti-Macron protest signs. The yellow vest movement. And in that he showed the actual picture of the sign and then the screenshot of the sign and they had completely photoshopped the sign. Utterly terrifies the elite because it unites aspects of both the left and the right. As French philosopher Alain de Benoist points out, the yellow vest movement is historic because it unites people with shared grievances from both sides of the political spectrum. Let's get one thing clear. The reason the establishment hates the Yellow Vest movement is because the establishment hates the working class. The reason why left-wing mouthpieces like Owen Jones and Lovey celebrities hate the Yellow Vest movement is because they hate the working class. The working class are not capable of making important decisions. That's why they are the working class, instead of leaders and professionals. You that was one of their tweets. Spent decades disingenuously pandering to the working class while feeling entitled to their vote, while offering them nothing but political and economic betrayal in return. Standards of living sunk, wage growth stagnated, fuel prices skyrocketed, and communities were destroyed thanks to your myopic insistence on importing millions of migrant wage slaves. Now the working class have finally got wise to it and withdrawn their support, prompting your thinly veiled disgust, elitism and snobbery to be fully revealed in all its fetid repulsiveness. I don't know where the Yellow Vest movement is going, but you can bet for a fact that the establishment's response is going to become more and more brutal, proving once again that globalism can only be pursued at the expense of the freedoms, prosperity, and dignity of ordinary working class people. All right, so the main thrust of an Alex Jones or a Paul Joseph Watson is that the globalist elite, the people who run the banks and the governments of these European countries and the major financial institutions and the Council on Foreign Relations, these global elites, the Hillary Clintons and their foundations, the Atlantic Council, they are, they are seeking to maintain power, maintain political power. They're parasitic on, the, all, on all economies across the world. And as regular people start to rise up, then what you have is these authoritarian-leaning people start to crack down on those folks. And so that is the main sort of argument that you usually will get if you watch an Alex Jones or somebody who is kind of of that milieu, that Paul Joseph Watson. And there's some, there's some attractiveness to that argument mm -hmm. that the Hillary Clintons of the world, the, the EU leaders of the world, these are the people who are who who are living off of the hard work uh, living off of the gains of the people who are just the working poor in these countries across the world they're eating caviar in davos while the rest of us are having our wages stagnated yeah and mcdonald's and right <laughs> they, they'll give us little things but you know there is some libertarians kind of drift towards that economic global you know globalist i'm anti-globalist and pro-populist message i think that's why we find some of those arguments attractive correct yeah and but we also see we we'll see the strings that are like you're right you know these people are living off our wages by voting for themselves to give themselves raises or just to steal a little bit more and more out of our checks to fund their pet projects that they right. want to do yep uh paul anything 
No, uh, you know, and we are seeing more and more, like, uh, one of our listeners up in Canada uh, is talking about how much distaste there is for uh, the Trudeau administration up there, and it's growing, especially in the uh, heartland of Canada. Uh, and they're starting to see their own yellow vest protesters pop up here and there, uh, basically because they're seeing just how stagnant and how anti-growth the Trudeau administration has been and how right. bad it has been treating the average citizen of Canada. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I think there is a lot of... Uh, it all goes back to sovereignty. Where does sovereignty lie? And we believe that sovereignty lies with the individual. You, as the listener of this program, are responsible for your life, and no one else is responsible for your life. You should not outsource that sovereignty to any government. You should be responsible for your choices, your body, what you do with it. You can't be drafted into a government to go fight a war that you do not, do not consent to. You you should be able to keep the what you make with your with your wages with your time is your money and not half the property is, goes to the government. Uh, uh, so so I think there's some commonality there, like global governance or major corporations who uh, who feed off of us in a parasitic manner, which I think that's sort of our feeling towards a lot of social media companies and tech companies. Mm-hmm. Um, they're setting up a, a, a world that is not necessarily uh, allowing us to be sovereign. And it doesn't matter if they're private institutions. These are global institutions that, one way or another, still get to control little aspects of our lives. But governments, corporations, yeah. financial institutions, these sorts of things. Yeah, and they trick you in doing their work for you, like Facebook. Give you, give you They trick you to give you all the... To give them the information they need to data mine on you, yes. Like this whole, you know, like, hey, how did you know the grow up? How did the puberty or this just hit you? You know, so they put pe- they force get they get to trick people into putting their photos in a small format, this perfect format, so they can see a photo ten years ago and you now currently. It's perfect for an AI program to learn, you know, you know your uh, growth patterns. Yeah. To see how, like, okay, so this is how we can age photos. We can teach the AI program now to age photos now. Thank you. So, yeah, you do that, and you don't know where the 10 the year progression meme starts, right? Yep. You don't know where that's some started. BuzzFeed writer. Mm-hmm. You know, was it? I do believe so. But who knows? Where do they get their funding from? Where did they get that idea from? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Look up like, Google Project Mockingbird. <laughs> uh, but, so, yeah, yeah. Y- yeah, so yeah. that's why I was so proud. Like, you're like, I see that Dear Leader wanted to do it, and then he flipped it. I was like, oh, perfect. You know, if they are, you know, scrubbing people's photos in that format, he just screwed it over. Mm-hmm. Always thinking, uh, how can I screw the NSA? Yep. So we we fa- we had uh, Sam, one of our researchers, fact check this video just so we because there's a compelling argument there, like th- when the working class starts to rise up in France or in Holland or in your area. The global leads crack down on you. They're the enemy. So that's a very compelling argument. So, But we wanted to take a look at the individual facts. You know, are citizens being cracked down? Do you have to get a license? Those sorts of things. So the first claim made is the French government is debating new laws that would criminalize all unauthorized protests. So to protest the government, you'd have to get the government to allow you to protest it. Uh, French Prime Minister Edouard Philippe has announced plans to punish people who hold unsanctioned protest after seven weeks of anti-government unrest. That's the BBC reporting that. All our sources are in here. So if you want to fact check the people who are fact checking Paul Joseph Watson, then check it out, all right? It'll be in in our show notes. Um, The French government wants to draft new legislation that will ban troublemakers from protest and clamp down on the wearing of masks at demonstrations. So you no longer have the right to anonymously protest your government. They want to force you to show your face. Why? Why would they want you to show your face, Harry, at a public demonstration? For reprisals, so they know who you are. Maybe get yourself a nice little audit. Yeah, audit, a nice good old no-knock raid. Or but how would they identify you? How would they scan f- to see who might be there? 
basically what they could do is just use their photos and just match it up different because they already have your photo on file from your um you got a driver's license yeah your driver's license your passport they can use that and try to match you up right. and find out who you exactly are yeah. it's the main reason they're like stop smiling why because we want to be able to match your photo up to something else i'm sorry if i'm at an anti-government protest i'm smiling just lo- uh, be honest with you but the but the Oh, sorry. Oh, uh, yeah, point. no, uh, with machine learning and AI now, uh, we can do background. Uh, we can basically take a uh, moving picture of a busy Manhattan street and pick out people's identities Yep. just in mass. So they want to force you to show your face. Speaking on French TV, uh, Prime Minister Philippe said the government would support a new law punishing those who do not respect the requirement to declare protests. Those who take part in unauthorized demonstrations and those who arrive at demonstrations wearing face masks would get in trouble. Known troublemakers would be banned from taking part in the demonstrations in the same way known football hooligans have been banned from stadiums. So, which is a which is a good thing and a bad thing, if you think about it. Okay, because tell of, me the good thing about it. The good thing is that it forces them to take their... Uh, so no one's showing up with a mask. The mask also dehumanizes you in your protests. Yes. No one trusts you because... Well, okay... What's going to get me off my couch? The guy wearing a mask or the guy not wearing a mask? The other thing, without the people wearing a mask, if there's someone that showed up to wear a mask, they're showing for no good, they're probably an agent provocateur, or some, you know, they're clearly there to do no good. Right. Uh, on the other hand, you know, passing this legislation that basically outright criminalizes a... Halloween? Uh, oh, sorry. Well, th- passing legislation that criminalizes... A protest removes the incentive for good behavior because you're already there being a criminal. So there's no reason for you not to flip over the cop car and set it on fire. Let me <clears throat> let me tell you, let me, uh, Americans, pay attention to this. Just because it's the ha-ha-ha, Frenchy-French, you need to pay attention to this because this is human behavior. This is how these institutions act. Uh, look what's happening to your ability to publish whatever you want on Facebook. I was just with a group of 50 content creators who are who are fringy, who are pushing the envelopes in terms of uh, what the government would like on these social networks. These are people who are virulently, virulently anti-war, uh, pro-freedom. There wasn't a person in there who hasn't had their ability to publish any of their content on any of these platforms completely demolished and you know why it's because americans people who work for those companies journalists government figures are all the ones cracking down on american companies it, it is it is happening here in the united states this is the danger of what happened to alex jones it they start with the conspiracy they start with what was your your three-tiered uh, first they came for the yes uh, sex workers Hackers and the conspiracy theorists. Yep, and then they come for you. And so if you think that the attitude of, it's just Alex Jones, it's fine, that's the wrong attitude. Because Mm -hmm. when you take that attitude, it's not about uh, allowing this guy who says, whatever he says about Sandy Hook, uh, turn it off. Unlike him. Yep. At uh, At the end of the day, I have seen more Alex Jones since he got banned than ever before. Like, it worked with Milo. It's gonna work with Gavin. Didn't work with Alex, because he's a meme, right? Yeah. Live by the meme, die by the meme. But, um, so listen up. This is this is this can happen here, and it takes a court fight to strike it down. And the ACLU is not on our side anymore. They were the ones who fought for freedom of speech in this country, and they're dead. The ACLU does not exist. Uh, those who question our institutions will not have the last word. That was the French. Prime Minister who said that. Let me repeat that. The head of the government. (laughs) Those who question our institutions will not have the last word, Mr. Mm. Philippe said. Mm. What has the reaction been? Senator Bruno Retaliu has welcomed the news, writing on Twitter that hooded troublemakers who participated in protest must, quote, be severely punished. Laurent Waquiz, leader of the Republican Party, tweeted that the move was not enough because it would take immediate effect. Left-wing leader Jean-Luc Mélenchon said that planned measures would mean that, quote, demonstrators can no longer demonstrate. He described Mr. Philippe as the king of the Shadnocks. 
a reference uh, to a bird-like cartoon character featured in part a popular French TV series known for their ruthlessnesses. Mm. Uh, in the future, Philippe said the onus would be on, quote, the troublemakers, not the taxpayers, to pay for the damage caused, which, frankly, I agree with. Like, if you're out vandalizing something, then, yeah, you should probably pay for it. Um, yeah, but it's France. Right. So, you know, 200 plus years ago, they were chopping people's heads off there. So claim number two, protest leaders are now being handcuffed and abducted in the night. Uh, let, so is this true? Are they being handcuffed and ca captured, disappeared in a Western country? A, Yellow Vest organizer Eric Drouet was arrested and faces trial for organizing an undeclared demonstration while meeting with friends at a restaurant. Eric, if you want to research this, it's in the show notes, but it's D-R-O-U-E-T. Eric Drouet leading, was leading one of the leading public figures in France's Yellow Vest protest. He was arrested for the second time late on Wednesday, prompting claims of police harassment. Ladies and gentlemen, this is exactly what happened in the Arab Spring with Mubarak's police. Mm -hmm. This is what dictator Slobodan Milosevic did to his protesters, the Optor. Read the fantastic book by the leader of Optor about... Uh, uh, I forget uh, revolution. It's some you'd have to look it up, but it was a great book about how to do protest. Every single what 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 these con this is exactly what Slobodan, Slobodan Milosevic, the guy who did ethnic cleansing in uh, Bosnia, who was like I think he was hanged by the world quarters in jail or something. I mean, that's exactly this is exactly what they did. They criminalized protest, and mm -hmm. then they started arresting the leaders. This is France. Right. The country that Jefferson loved. Yeah. The, the, Which is crazy. It's like, birth like organize, yeah, organizing <laughs> protests. So let me get this straight. Well, it's not declared yet. So you're organizing it, man. <laughs> so <laughs> fill out the paperwork first? No. The other thing is that's why it's so important for like movements like this to not to declare like a leader so they go and get co-opted by like political parties or so they know what head of the snake to cut off. Yes. Yeah. And we've seen similar things here in the United States with universities declaring certain areas as free speech zones where you can have your protest over here, but you better not come over here into this part of the commons. Yeah. Uh, we've seen, well, we have major American cities requiring permits for protests as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if, uh, if you think about, remember Ferguson, they forced these, they basically forced, marched these people. They forced them. Couldn't stop. Nope, can't stop. Got to keep moving. So what was his great crime? Now, uh, 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 second time, second time he was arrested in a Western country. Yeah. Like, what did you, th what do you think Eric Duray did? What was, what horrific act could he have been planning? I'm thinking. I mean, we might as well call him a terrorist. I'm thinking he had a Facebook. Okay. And he was talking to people. Okay. Well, well he was going to do a physical protest. What do you think they were going to do? I'm guessing smash windows. I mean, think of the worst thing you can think of. I'm guessing they're probably going to go in, smash, some w just show up somewhere. Right. You know, possibly do stuff. Right. Maybe tar and feather. Yeah, who knows? Right. You know, yeah. like build a guillotine. Something awful. Awful. He was arrested on suspicion of organizing an unofficial protest. In Paris, oh, okay, unofficial. Which honestly, like, shoot the guy, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, Oof. he didn't get permission. Um, after he encouraged people to gather and lay candles near the Champs de Elise, what is it, the Champs de Elise, or however he's Champs Elise, the big arch thingy, for those who had you died. Like the is that no, what you're talking the, about? No, I'm talking. Which, yeah. which arch? The Champs Elises. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how do you say that. Uh, Fail French. See, I completely blew the all the tension that I had built up. Baby broadcasters, that's not how you do it. Uh, it's basically this long avenue. Okay, it's an avenue in France. It's really pretty. And uh, so what they were going to do is they were going to l l lay candles along this road. For those who had died during the protest. At the front? Can you fucking believe this monster? The candles were probably for fires. He was going to... Set fires. He was going to set fires. Yeah. Along uh, one of the most famous roads in France. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
and he was going to get a bunch of people to light fires. I mean, this is practically arson. Yeah, practically. Practically. The City yeah. of Lights cannot have a bunch of candles laying around. You can't. I mean, I'm starting to be on Macron's side here. The demonstration was aimed at shocking public opinion, as he put it. His swift arrest prompted one political leader to label the protest leader's detention as an abuse by power of the government. I mean, I, I honestly may not have gone far enough. Everything that happens here is political, he told reporters after his lease, release. We have been questioned at least four or five times on the same topics. So how did Drouet become a leader? This man is 33 years old. He is a truck driver who rose to prominence during the emergence of the Yellow Vest, the Gilles Jaune or Yellow Vest Movement in October and November 2018. I do not speak French, so do not trust my pronunciation. Uh, the movement is named after the Yellow Vest that people are required to keep in their car by law. Mm -hmm. uh, Drouet is credited with suggesting that angry drivers deliberately block or slow traffic in their area on November 17th, causing enough disruption to attract the government's attention. Uh, some 300,000 people took part in protests the first weekend. His first arrest came on December 22nd during the sixth wave of protesters. Um, so what do you think his crime here was? What do you think he did on this one? I mean, first arrest. It's got to be big, right? But it, maybe it's like a gateway. Like yeah. He would probably just stabbed a lady. Oh, fomenting civil dis or, or yeah, civil like unrest. Arming or, people mm -hmm, with mm -hmm. illegal guns in France. Arming babies. Yes, he was arming babies. He was strapping dynamite to children like ISIS. And he was wandering them into the police camps. Yep. Um, Deputy Interior Minister Laurent Nunez said that Mr. Drouet had organized an undeclared demonstration and had changed the planned venue. <gasps> How dare he? He was charged with carrying a weapon in the form of a baton for taking part in a group formed with intent to commit violence. The lawyer said the baton was just a piece of wood in his bag and argued that was in his bag, excuse me, and argued the arrest was politically motivated and aimed at discrediting him. So he had a piece of wood. He had uh, a, 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 I have a bat. So a concealed weapon. I have a pencil on my desk that's in the shape of a Louisville slugger. So technically, it's a baton. Yeah. I mean, I'm a dangerous yeah. criminal. You should investigate me. So as America pushes to disarm everyone and right. to right. neuter our ability to defend ourselves, right. pay attention because wood. They, <laughs> yeah, no, they're going to find any reason if you have a magazine in your handgun that you have a legal permit for, but you can squeeze that eighth round in and there's a seven round limit in your state, they're going to find a reason to arrest you and discredit you. Mm -hmm. And we have a major cultural problem where the moment you're arrested and charged with a crime, oh, well, yeah, he was doing illegal stuff. That's yeah. bad. Yeah, he was a, he was a criminal. Uh, he was detained again on January 2nd for suspicion of un organizing another undeclared protest. This is a real bad dude. Uh, after going on social media with a call for action, this time a few dozen people took part and no yellow vests were involved. After his arrest, Mr. Drouet's lawyers told the BBC that his client had not taken part in any demonstration but was simply meeting friends in central Paris. He was simply a participant, not the organizer. Uh, so th the third claim is that President Macron was a glo is a globalist authoritarian. Now, his approval rating is at 23%. Uh, that was absolutely true, according to Reuters. It was down six points from the previous... Um, the, the prime minister who said that the institutions will not be questioned is down to 26%. Macron's approval ratings matches the low charted by his predecessor, Francois Hollande, in late 2013. Hollande was then considered to be the least popular leader in modern French history. Yep. Uh, the establishment, another claim, the establishment has set in motion a character assassination of the small but growing ye Yellow Vest movement in the U.K., According to a story in the local, one of the featured Yellow Vest movement is in the distrust and even hatred felt by many protesters towards the French media. Uh, although physical attacks are rare, journalists are regularly insulted by protests, called liars, whores, journalopes, uh, and are the targets of hateful attacks and death threats on social media. So the journalists are mad that they're getting called names at these protests, even though they've been willing participants in all of the bullshit that has come from these the people like Macron and uh, and the Hillary Clintons of the world, like it, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. People no. are tired of, tired of being lied to. I mean, it's very similar to what's been going on here in the states. Is yeah. various groups have labeled 
journalism that they either don't agree with or that they can prove false as fake news. Right. Uh, maybe a little bit more virulent over in France, which, come on, America, step it up. If you get, if you're a reporter and you get a quote from a uh, source who works for the government, that's gospel. But if, if you're just a random person on the street and you tell somebody something, mm-hmm. that person is has malintent. Like in the mind of journalists, like if, if uh, I walk up to a journalist, I being someone who has some working knowledge of politics in Indiana, and I told this journalist, hey, this person, you know, Jim Mayer's thinking about running for office, they might believe it. But if they talk to somebody who works in some government, that's maybe a bad example, but like... When it comes to the national government, if you have a source who works for a who collects a federal paycheck, that person's word is ironclad. It's never questioned. The New York Times, uh, uh, that that Trump story that you're hearing all about about how the FBI investigated him, you mean the investigation with Page Struck, mm-hmm. <laughs> McCabe, like the person quoted in the article was Lisa Page, and they gave absolutely no context that this was the person involved, and had her conduct de- uh, demolished by. Right by texting with Peter Strzok about Donald Trump and wanting to bring him down. Mm-hmm. Like, the, this was the source for the story. And it was already in public records. It's such a, you know... And yeah. so people look at the media and they go, we here in America feel the same way that they feel over there. You know, once someone wrote on a display, BFM, C News, and LCI spread lies and hate. One protester, 43-year-old Michael Bonjour, who was willing to speak to the media, believes that the media in France is censored by the government. I don't think the media has been very fair to the Yellow Vests, he said. They've really focused on violence from our side, which I admit is not good. And it feels like they only half-heartedly show the police violence. I'm not sure it's their fault, though. Maybe they're being censored by Macron, but I definitely don't trust the reports I see in the press. And this is the disconnect. People in America, people in France, people in Britain, people in the Western world see the disconnect between what they see with their own eyes and what Mm -hmm. they see in the press. Correct. And if you're involved in a local event and you're at a local political event and then you watch it on the TV news, it's like you were at two different events. If you go to the inauguration and you turn on the news, there's two different versions of the same event and neither one of them are what you went to. It's always it, And so enough people have gone to enough events or have been involved in enough stuff where they've just gone, I don't think you're telling the truth about this stuff. Like, nothing's adding up. So another protester, Letitia Diat, said that she didn't trust the report she saw. The 38-year-old said that the violence she'd seen on the Yellow Vest side was a result of frustration with the police. Quote, I've been to several of the protests in Paris, and the things I've seen, police officers hitting people who weren't doing anything wrong four or five times, sometimes over the head, horrible injuries with people covered in blood. Then you watch the news, and you just see the Yellow Vest trying to attack the police when, in my experience, that only happens once the, po- once the police get aggressive. And so you're seeing people on YouTube. Good luck trying to find a, a YouTube video on the yellow uh, yellow vests that isn't from some major media outlet in France. Mm-hmm. Good luck. The, the, the ability to... The only way that you can actually see some of the videos that you see on, like, Paul Joseph Watson's videos are, like, to really, 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 really dig for them. Yes. You know? And, and like... The only source of the video that I could find was retweeted by David Duke. So I was like, I'm not going to touch that one. (laughs) So uh, you don't see the protester side of things. Mm -hmm. And then so that's why when I watched this, I was like, wait a minute. This is not what I'm seeing when I watch the BBC. Like I'm seeing something totally different. This Paul Joseph Watson thing. So that's why I had the researchers look into it. Uh, and this is just amazing stuff. Like, this validates kind of what he said in that video. Um, protesters say the media coverage is one-sided and biased, with only incidents of violence being reported shortly before Christmas. And that's always how it is. That's why you can never get violent at a protest. That's all they report on. Mm-hmm. That's why King was such a genius with nonviolence and, and why nonviolence is the only way to throw overthrow an authoritarian regime. Um, Optor did it. Uh, it, it is the only, you cannot, you have to resist because if the image is the police kicking your head in and you're not fighting back, that's a powerful image because Mr. and Mrs. America watch Bull Connor sicking German shepherds on black people in Alabama and they go, this is not who we are. I may not be for the blacks, but I'm definitely not for that. And so nonviolence, when they see you being abused, it has a real impact. Um, protester, a short, uh, so 
Shortly before Christmas, a clip from France 3's regional new report went viral, showing a studio uh, anchor cutting off the reporter as she was about to mention incidents of police violence against protesters. It was seized on evidence of media bias, although the TV station said it was simply because they ran out of time. Uh, it's it's like the the uh, there was a San Antonio TV station that was going to supply uh, someone to CNN to talk about the border. He was a local reporter, mm-hmm. but then it was KUSI, I think. Um, and then when CNN found out that the guy was pro wall and the and the station's reporting had been like, yeah, people here kind of are for the wall, they they canceled him. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's those little things where you just go, yep, you're in the bag. Yep. According to Voice of America, which is run by the United States federal government, it, it not allowed to broadcast here because it's considered pro- propaganda. French media announced against ye- violent event. So French media denounce against violent yellow vest attacks on the press. Journalists covering the protests are increasingly becoming a target of the dem- demonstrations as a result of a lot of this. One of the security agents working with the TV crew was beaten. A reporter was pushed to the to the ground. They were trying to take away her camera. Um, Reporters Without Borders Secretary General Christophe Delors called on the authorities to take action. Um, so let's go to claim number five. Uh, number five, a right-wing AFD politician. AFD is sort of the, um, they call it the new Nazi party. They don't call it that. The media calls it that. Uh, but it's the more right-wing populist uh, Germany first group. Um, in Germany is beaten almost to death by left-wing terrorists and barely makes it in the news. Uh, so a researcher, uh, Sam writes, I don't know how much coverage of the, how much coverage of this got when it happened, but when I Googled AFD politician in Germany beaten, the entire first page were the results from the past week about Frank Magnets being beaten unconscious in what appears to be a politically motivated attack. Magnets is a member of the German par- parliament and leader of the Alternative for Germany party. It's a relatively new party that ran on an anti-immigration, anti-Islam platform. They won almost 13% of the vote in 2017. We covered them here yeah. on the program back in the day. Uh, so number six, claim number six from Rahim Kassam. In the past few hours, the, quote, Yellow Vest UK have had their social media accounts banned. According to The Independent, Yellow Vest organizer James Goddard's Facebook profile disappeared amid calls for police to prevent the group from harassing politicians, journalists, and pro-EU protesters. A spokesperson for Facebook says, we have removed James Goddard's Facebook pages and groups for violating our policies on hate speech. We will not tolerate hate speech on Facebook, which creates an environment of intimidation which will may provoke real-world violence. So, Facebook... Removed the head of the UK Yellow Vest p- account. Uh, what I want to note here is the expansion of the definition of hate speech. It's no longer against a minority group. It's now being used to shield politicians and, and those in positions of power from criticism. Yep. And, you know, here in, even in Indiana, we're considering hate legislation, hate crime legislation, uh, which within i'm going to guess within five to ten years will be expanded to protect add a protected class around politicians and police they're trying to add police firefighters soldiers teachers trying to exempt them from the income tax here yeah and so if you're a teacher or you're a a soldier you're not going to have to pay in indiana income tax what kind of crazy bs like you want to talk about creating a special class of citizen like they don't right. have to pay taxes. Like it, what do you? You already pay their student we're loans. We're going back two thousand three hundred years to the city state of Sparta, right. where the soldiers, the Spartans, were the higher class, and everything else was taken care of for by the slave cultures that they had had captured and uh, made subjects to the Spartans. So uh, the UK Yellow Vest had their PayPal account removed. Also, according to the independent, uh, independent PayPal removed James Goddard's account in which he used to receive donations. Uh, whether asked when asked whether Goddard's activities violated PayPal's terms and conditions, a spokesperson told the Independent, "Quote: Due to our privacy policy, we cannot comment on any specific ac- email customer account." Uh, they had, quote, journalists show up at their elderly parents' houses. I couldn't find anything supporting this or even what it's about, uh, Sam said. Had lies spread about them on national TV and in the media. 
I also couldn't find anything about this to which they were referring. So what are the UK LFS protesting? It appears there are several groups in the UK protesting. Uh, Kylie Crawley, a UK uh, Yellow Vest protester, said she wanted to stand against cuts to services for her 17-year-old daughter, Casey, who has Down syndrome. Quote, to me, the French Yellow Vest were ordinary people wanting to get out and tell people how bad things had got and how they wanted change. Uh, Jim Scott, another UK Yellow Vest protester, said the vests had become a powerful symbol for change. Uh, the... Um, they're facing the same things in France, austerity, cuts to public services, expanding the gap between the rich and the poor. That's how this movement has started. Another group of protesters in Yellow Vest assembled outside British Parliament. This group is pro-Brexit. Uh, they waved the Union Jack. They burned EU flags and denounced left-wing scum. They chanted, we're not far right, we're just right. So claim number seven, thousands of jihadists roaming our streets every day, people being stabbed to death every single day. Now, according to the Times in Britain, the British intelligence officers have identified 2,300 jihadist extremists living in Britain as potential attackers. About 3,000 people from the total group are judged to pose a terrorist threat and are under investigation and active monitoring and 500 operations being run by police and intelligence services. The 20,000 others have featured in, been featured in previously inquiries and are categorized as posing a residual risk or are a person of interest. This is also reported by the Daily Express, which is a right-wing tabloid. It's not clear over which time scale the figures relate to. Uh, Sam says, personally, I would be very skeptical about these potential threats being reported, and these numbers seem absurdly high. Of course, authorities can label whoever they want as a potential threat. Now, we saw this in America after 9-11. Yeah, he's modeling his terrorist threat T-shirt, the We Are Libertarians T-shirt that Harry has on. The, you know, the, uh, in 2000, I think it was 2009, the Fusion Center in Missouri. Uh, so a fusion center is, it was after 9-11, they built these fusion centers where local police, state police, federal agencies all would fuse together information and share resources. And there was a report released by the Missouri Fusion Center that said, potential terrorists include anyone with a Ron Paul bumper sticker, a Libertarian Party bumper sticker, mm -hmm. uh, you know, an Alex Jones bumpo bumper sticker. It, and so it d included anybody basically that believed in the Constitution. Three percenters. It was three percenters around yes. there, too. Yeah. So uh, you saw after 9-11, many, many, keepers. many, Sorry. many, many, many uh, Muslims were targeted by the federal government. Uh, so, uh, B, according to an official report from the UK House of Commons, there were 280, diff uh, there were two, or 268, homicides and vi involving a knife or sharp instrument in the year 2018. Um, so, according to their statistics office, there were 719 homicides in England and Wales in the year ending in June 2018. Most violent attacks were in England and Wales. They involved no weapons. Um, it's still levered, it averages less than one claim a day, so people are being stabbed to death every single day would be false if we took that literally. You could also take that as a figure of speech, but, uh, you know, it's not every day. It's uh, every other day. <laughs> <laughs> Violent crimes involving a knife or sharp instrument are still on the rise with 40,000 offenses in the year of June 2018. Uh, claim number nine, there's also speculation ranging which is unconfirmed at this point that governments are already conspiring with mainstream media networks to release pre-written stories if tensions escalate that will do everything possible to minimize the chance of events being seen as a European spring. They want to avoid this being seen as the European spring. It is, and America's spring is coming soon, FYI. Give it five years or less. Yeah. Um, Sam said he could not find any evidence that this is actually taking place that there was any sort of coordination that they were trying to plant pre-written news stories yeah but we know that news outlets have pre pre-written material right. that they can just slap a date on salem and, right yeah it, it's yeah. just there to have because it saves them because if they get it up first they're the one that gets the most hits and that's the game that they play so on the claim that they're uh, that on the mainstream TV channels they're photoshopping and censoring anti macron signs, uh, RT reports that Axel absolutely happened. 
Um, Jean Baptiste Reddy, Reddy said he was shocked when he learned that Channel France Three had sanitized an AFP photograph showing him holding a sign that read Macron out. The channel, which dropped the out part or Red's message, blamed it on a human error. Uh, so that uh, was the sign that was in the video. How, how it, do you humanly error to open Photoshop by accident? select the out by accident, delete it, and match the background color by accident. As a person that spends literally eight hours a day in Adobe products, it's absolutely impossible. My, my, <laughs> I, I, my, my professional career is Photoshop, uh, Illustrator, Audition. That sounds like somebody picked Premier, the whole bouquet no. of whoops-a-daisies yes. in order to make that happen. <laughs> yep. uh, so... We, we have identified the human error, and we have taken them out. Uh, now, that came from Sputnik and RT as the news sources, which we always uh, view with suspect, but the, 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 the evidence is in front of your eyes. You see the video. You see, like, they claim th they have a statement on it. So when you, when you actually start to get into it and uh, you have somebody like Sam fact check a video like that, you find that he was about 90% of it was verifiable information, and the other 10% we just couldn't find which doesn't mean that it's incorrect. It's just that we couldn't find that particular piece of information. He lives in a different continent, so it's different internet and uh, different sources. But uh, it, it was interesting. Are, are you surprised to find out that a lot of those claims are true? Uh, not really. No, because the, the this is what they do. Because I trust Paul Joseph Watson more than I trust a government at this point. Which is strange, yeah. <laughs> right. Because it was how, same, did, how did I get here? Yeah, because it was the same type of stuff that was going on about the Arab Spring and even like even the Bundy Ranch stuff going right. on the West. You know, just to, they just they take news articles and they spin it the way they want. Even the Tea Party protests went. It was just almost like this, some of the early brewings of some sort of an American spring here, but they had a, you know, they put a leader in there and then allow a political party to co-op them. Right. Let's give our final thoughts on the Yale Vest protest. Uh, let's go with Paul. Give Harry some time. He just spoke. Let's break it up with Paul. Well, uh, I'm cautiously optimistic with the uh, Yellow Vest protests. A lot of the things that they are pushing for, uh, I don't agree with, for instance, the social services being offered. Uh, but in terms of the protests, they've been promised these things. They've been taxed and paid for these things. And now these things are being cut back. And I understand that frustration. Uh, I just hope that in a lot of these areas that... There are some liberty-minded people there that are going to be able to step up and say, I understand your frustration. Here's how we move forward and build institutions that are going to be able to provide you with what you need without making you dependent on something that is going to be subject to austerity. Right. Good point. It's it's the same thing that's they're trying to push here. Like, hey, pay these higher taxes you will get all these different benefits, but at the end of the day that we know, you can see that these are unfunded, there's no way you can pay for these things, so when it does come time to actually pay the bill, they can't, and they'll roll them back. They roll them back. If they can roll them back on in France, which has you know cheap power and everything else, hey, what the heck do they think they'll do to you here in the United States or anywhere else in the rest of the world? Is that there's a reason why um, Brexit is trying to happen? They're trying to get out of the European Union. They see that like it's it's a terrible game of um, who's going to pay the, the the bill at the other day, and the last one in is going to get stuck with this bill, right? You know. All right, I think that um, this is something we're going to watch a little bit closer because I think. In America, it's very hard to watch foreign countries because they don't speak English, and so it's hard to watch the Arab Spring. We watched the program was in existence when the Arab Spring was taking place. We watched it with great interest here on the program, uh, and I remember enough of it to watch some of what's happening with the Yellow Vest stuff going. Uh, the French government's acting like uh, exactly the uh, government it propped up in Egypt. <laughs> But we look at those dirty Egyptians, those people, you know, and I, I mean, I'm not saying Egyptians are dirty. I'm saying I think that's the mentality of of how our governments view those countries. Like they're they're I, I think we look at uh, our, our populations, look at other countries and go, well, that's not America. So it's not that couldn't happen here. What happens in Pakistan wouldn't happen here. 
what you don't know is that a lot of what's happening in uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina, was funded by the CIA. It was hun- funded by the American government. And what happened in, in Egypt was funded by the Obama administration. And so what you see on the news is, oh, this is Twitter is being used. Twitter and tear gas is being used to bring about democracy in places that have never had democracy in their life. This is so wonderful. And glowing reports from CNN and Anderson Cooper's there and they're sending reporters. And mm-hmm. and it's just what uh, this is great to see these people who have been downtrodden finally fight back, like not knowing that we were the ones that kept them downtrodden with by keeping puppet dictators in place. And oh, guess what? They're still there. Um, the the, yeah. the Don't like you want to thank Obama for helping you. Yeah, like in Congo, the CIA candidate accidentally lost, so everybody's freaking out down there because that's where all the cobalt for your phone comes from. Um, so, uh, you know, and now that we have the same exact things happening in the streets of France, and it beginning in America and it beginning in Europe, across Europe in Britain. We've got to really get a hold of social media. This is a problem. This th- these people are dangerous. The, we need to get a hold of this violent, hateful rhetoric. Uh, do we not see the double standard? Like one group of people, one group of foreigners, are puppets of Western governments, and therefore just Western government extensions. And then when it happens in the Western governments, they're like, uh oh. Because they can actually lose power, right? Like, mm-hmm. if they lose a- an election in Egypt or the Congo, they can just buy off that guy, right? Which is what they do. But if they lose in France or they lose in Brussels or they lose in America, they wig out. You know, that's why I really don't buy a lot of what is going on with the Russia narrative. Um, I Do I think that Donald Trump is an honorable man who is looking out for the best interest of America? Absolutely not. I think he is looking out for the interest of Donald Trump. I think he's looking out for the interest of protecting his butt because he knows he has some real shady business dealings with the Russians that he wants to protect. And he also has a pathological need to not say anything bad about people who say nice things about him. And those just happen to be authoritarian dictators. Might be a problem, right? It's like when a show starts out with surviving and then it's your name, it's not not going to be good for you. There are just certain rules in life. Like dictators praise you. Cable channels sh- show, you know, surviving dear leader. Like not good. <laughs> so... Um, but, uh, my point is that a lot of this Russian narrative is a ruse to really clamp down on our ability as regular citizens to speak out against our government. And you don't have to be a radical person to understand that that's a problem and want to protect your ability to have free speech. You don't have to side with extremists like Alex Jones or people who are interested like Russia Today, or any of those people. But you do have to recognize that your politicians are trying to create backdoors to control the greatest invention in history, which is the Internet, mm-hmm. and because it threatens them. Yep. It's time to wake up a little bit, right? And start looking out for yourself, looking out for your community, and looking out for your neighbors, mm-hmm. and going... Um, I, I like I look at somebody like Ocasio Cortez. I don't think that this is a person who is sitting there scheming to bring about a Trojan horse of socialism in the United States. I think she genuinely believes that her ideas are right and that she can save the planet from destruction if she brings about this plan. Right? We we have. I'm not going to question her integrity and say that she's an evil person. But I think that people buy into ideas and the power of ideas have consequences. And one of those consequences is sometimes people push ideas that really have negative consequences and benefit a certain class of people. And, uh, you know, silencing people, silencing political speech on social media just so happens to benefit the more powerful elements of our society and our government. And uh, that's not good for us. And so... Even if we have to side with an Alex Jones for a period of time to say, I'm going to fight on this hill with this guy, uh, you got to do it. Like, you just have to say, like, yeah, I don't support everything that this guy's about, but, like, this principle of free speech, even on a private platform, is important to me. And as a consumer of your product, sir, I would like you to not silence free speech. Like, I'm looking for an alternative to Patreon. I've lost nearly $100 because... You know, people are pulling off of Patreon. I I understand that. 
I totally get that. I'm look. I'm working on alternatives because of, because of it. You know, it. I, conversely, let me just say this. I had an alternative that I could not sign up for today because I did not have the working cash flow to do it. I did not have the capital to do it. And so if you pull off of Patreon now, you are going to limit the availability of options in the future, right? So if you're going to pull off of Patreon, you've got to do it now. Then go to we are libertarians slash support, we are libertarians.com slash support. Sign up on PayPal, which isn't great either. Like, guess what, guys? Like, as libertarians who don't support, you know, uh, I, I, I support my country. Mm -hmm. I support politicians of integrity, uh, you know, who are going to reduce the size and scope of government like Justin Amash. Um, but overall, I don't support uh, a lot of what goes on. I'm anti-war. Like, pick a Silicon Valley company that's really going to side with us. <laughs> like yeah. you know, it's, well, I mean, it's, for that matter, pick a credit card company that's going right. to side with us, right? Which you can send checks. I'll send you send me send me a note. I'll send you my private address. You can here to the six one six studios, the, the Klozinski studios, for our good friend Phyllis Klozinski, the very first person that really gave me uh, a cash donation to get things started here at We Are Libertarians. Love Phyllis. Uh, please prayers for Phyllis and her health. Uh, she is. She's she's making it, but uh, yeah, please pray for her. She's a wonderful human being and very important to me. Um, so, so yeah, like there's there's Bitcoin donations. There's other ways to donate, mm -hmm. but if you don't do that, then I don't have options. I can't leave. I almost get stuck because I was stu I st you know it's easier to be on Patreon because they do everything. It's like one stop shopping, right? Yeah. It's a great yeah. service. They provide a great service. Mm -hmm. I'm pissed at them. Because they provide the best service, they are the best product, but they have decided that they want to be editors instead of a utility. Pornhub is actually creating one, which is weird, by the way. It's, I've read I'm, that I'm not doing that. I know, like, I'm just I'm saying. Not, I'm not supporting is... that, no. <laughs> I'd rather support Patreon than before I support Pornhub, to be quite honest. They're, hey, they're, eh, it's a multi-million dollar company. They're making some big moves. I kind of like some well, of the moves. Making, making. some yeah. big, big what? Big moves. Okay. Big moves. All right, I heard I, they, they, they make the other one too. Yes, Chris. Yeah. Uh, but what? You don't like the fact that they plow the roads when the government fails? Yeah, they do plow a lot of plowing. <laughs> You're not helping. You're. <laughs> they also have a very. <laughs> You're a child. They also have a very se secure VPN connection. They also help support creators. They protect privacy. Honestly, it's like, man, you know. Right. All right. So that's uh, that's my that's my spiel. I want to thank the Libertarian Coalition. I want to thank Christy Avery. I want to thank Craig DaCosta and Jason Doolittle. Uh, thank you guys for your uh, patronage at a level that uh, at a hundred dollars, and one is a hundred and twenty-five a month. You guys are uh, all stars, and thank you to all of our patrons who make all of the financial uh, gears work here. Um, we, we have lots of big plans that we're talking through, uh, and we, we really do appreciate your patronage and, uh, you guys make it possible as well as all of our listeners just sharing the show. Um, I will be joining a podcast, uh, on a pretty consistent basis, but the first one is this coming Thursday. And I really want you guys to get behind this one because it's really important to me. Uh, it is with Frank Caliendo, who was on Mad TV and ESPN. And like the Frank Caliendo, like the Frank Caliendo. It's not like a guy I made up. Like the guy who does the Bush impression better than Bush does. Like like Mad TV. Frank like Caliendo? yeah, John Madden impression. Yeah, John yeah. Madden. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, backstage helps Bush. And Al Jackson, who's on Daily Blast Live. They're two comedians that uh, I know through the day job. I work at the Bob and Tom Show. Um, I I don't like to mix my peanut butter and my chocolate because, frankly, we don't do politics at Bob and Tom. We we're an escape from politics. Mm -hmm. And uh, w and I don't want what I say here to shade any of that. And I never, ever, ever, ever want to use like I'm looking like I'm using that opportunity, that job to grow this because I've done it without that. And I, I, I want to continue to do that. But this is this is an opportunity that I got after I had a conversation last week with Frank when he was a at the show. And uh, we had like a two or three hour conversation about politics and about uh, the, the, the goal of the show is can like a bunch of people who have a bunch of different views agree maybe not on politics but like at least be agreeable as they talk about it mm -hmm. 
And having never really heard from a libertarian the first episode, they were like, wait, what is this? And so I was the shiny new tour. I don't feel like I did a great job. They were really excited about it. So I think like new like people who've never heard of libertarianism are going to like go, wow, this is mind blowing. Like you guys, I think you're, you're going to be I feel like I didn't do a great job at it. Like you yeah. guys will listen to you tell me. But um, because I wasn't prepared to talk about that in, in such a, a an elevator pitchy way. Yeah. So you kind of just gave Babby's first uh, impression of libertarianism, whereas at this point, most of our audience is going to be like, yeah, but what about Rothbard? Right, yeah, that's part of the problem is that I'm in it, like, my friend goes, yeah, but you host a libertarian podcast, I'm like, yeah, but I don't, I don't do the libertarian 101 speech every day, I haven't done it in months, you know, and so, mm -hmm. so, and, and I was nervous, to be quite frank, like, this is, <laughs> this is a great opportunity for me, it's a great opportunity for the network, uh, there, you know, Frank, uh, afterwards said, you know, I, I was, I, it went really well. Want you to come on on a consistent basis. So I'm going to do that about once a week and, uh, it's called Al and Frank try to be serious, which you can get at frankpods.com. Frank, like you, you know, F R A N K P O D S or Al Frank and Al or Al and Frank try to be serious.com. Uh, you can find it in iTunes, any of that stuff. So I'm going to be a uh, pretty regular uh, a, a guest, I think. Uh, I, I hope. I, I look forward to it. I had a lot of fun doing it. And I really want you guys to get behind it. Frank's going to come on the show. Uh, maybe uh, we'll pr ask him to do some, uh, maybe like a bush bumper. That'd be kind of funny. You're listening to We Are Libertarians. I don't know what that is. <laughs> um, but... Uh, <laughs> But yeah, I will be joining uh, them uh, hopefully on a on a regular basis, and uh, very excited about it because I it, like a it's a great opportunity for me personally to to not just like a professionally b to talk about what we do here, but and the philosophy, but mainly like the mission of the show is to get people to from different walks of life who believe different things to converse about big ideas in a way that is friendly. Hmm. And like that to me at this point is more important than pushing libertarianism. <laughs> and I think guys who are of Frank and Al's level and who are not political people and who are not trying to push an ideology, they're just trying to understand the world and are smart guys with different points of view and are, are um, cultural figures. I think those people can be incredibly important in bringing about some of that change because if if I, an inherently political figure, start a show, I just don't think people buy into that as much as like a disarming listen with Frank, right? Yeah. Um, so so I, I really need this audience to help make an impression there, a good impression, right? Mm -hmm. No, no uh, particular... Wee. No, none of those jokes. Flat out, I'm telling you, that is absolutely mm. banned from here on out mm. uh, for, for personal reasons that I won't get into. Like that, be be on your best behavior. Do not embarrass your leader. There will be swift consequences if you do. Um, so I, I just, uh, I want this show to work because I think this is the type of show that can help save the country. And we have been talking internally about how do we get... How do we build a, a system where we can get 50 or 100 people in every our, – our goal is in every town or county or city, how do we get 100 people or a per 1% of the people in that town or 50 people to come together on a regular basis and talk about the issues of their community in a way that is non-threatening, that is based on respect and the dignity of every person participating – like how do we how do we build that kind of world? How do we do that? And this is a great extension. Th Frank and I just realized like our goal is the same, and uh, that this is the kind of goal that Americans need to have all around. Like mm. libertarians, I think sometimes let's go to that social event so we can recruit, so we can get new libertarians. And that's the wrong way to think. Like the right way to think is let's go there to understand what the Republicans think. Let's go there to understand what the s the Democrats think. I almost said socialist. Let's go there to think, you know. And like in the first episode, Al called me out and he goes, "That that word that you're using to me is kind of like a tainted word." And it just, and I went, "Yeah, I never thought of it that way." You're right. So, uh, there is uh, that's that's one of the things that I'm working on. 
um, a couple of the things. And then th there's some behind the scenes stuff that uh, that I'm working on uh, in terms of opportunities. So um, that second show a week, <laughs> let's talk about that. Uh, I just um, I partly don't want to do it anymore uh, because it is just hard to get co-hosts and it is hard to get everybody in the research team to fire up that second show and let's do four hours of show a week. Now that I'm doing this show that I think uh, I need to spend a little time on, uh, I've got some private consulting things that I'm doing. It's it's just going to be a little tough to do two shows a week. I'm not going to be able to crank out eight shows a month. We are Libertarians episodes. Now that we're doing the daily, there's a lot of content, and I don't want to frustrate people. I'm going to do more dailies um, so I can have be a little more present. Uh, so And I'm not, not going to do a second show a week. Like I... What I really would kind of like to do is maybe more interviews, maybe get into that a little bit, not talk to kind of some of the same people that you hear from. Like Scott Horton one week was like on 17 the different libertarian podcasts. But talk to like um, talk to maybe some Washington intellectuals. Uh, so there also will be more swamp episodes. Rob has shifted his schedule and he is going to be more committed to doing those swamp episodes. We've done four if you have not listened to the swamp explained rob was a longtime washington insider fly on the wall guy fascinating person and uh, he and i are going to be more committed to doing that show on a very regular basis maybe once a week even uh and so uh and, and i may separate that out from the we are libertarians feed and put that into its own feed uh just because i think it uh it deserves its own standalone thing so I'm going to be doing more podcasts, <laughs> but maybe not more. It, it may maybe not under the episode 338 banner, right? You know. So, um, and trying to get the research team and me and everybody to do two shows a week is just when we're doing we're putting out so much con like so much effort into these shows. It was easy to do two shows a week when it was like one show was just. Everybody'd show up and we f we'd fuck around for two hours, mm -hmm. and then the other show was like, yeah, we have a couple stories, but we fuck around for two hours. Mm -hmm. So these are these are much more labor intensive, and uh, I just decided over the break that uh, I'm just going to be honest with you that uh, I just don't think I can do the swamp. Al and Frank try to be serious. We are libertarians twice a week. Bonus material, a daily run the network, edit all the podcasts, edit all the videos that you see, do all this stuff, and you just go, mm -hmm. at a certain point, I just got to I gotta have something give, right? Like, Correct. Or else yeah. you're just going to kill yourself because I got to have a private life too. Mm -hmm. you know. So so that's where we're at. This, this will continue. It will always be Tuesday.